Okay. Uh, hi, I'm Dr. Ronan McCabe. You're listening to Apostasy Now. This is real. This is real. This is not real. And it's now it's real again. Ah, you don't know what's going to happen. Yeah. Yeah. Almost professional, I think. It's amazing. Amazing for you, I tell you. I think, I think I might have been born to be on the internet or something like that. Glad to be back in your ear with another episode of Apostasy Now. This week we've got two guests. We've got Allison Tiemann and we've got Karen Strawn, both of the Honey Badgers Brigade fame. Now, if you don't know about this group, uh, I'd point you in their direction. You can find them on YouTube very easily. They've also got their own website. And they've got a great deal of content that they put out, along with a great supporting group. All of which amounts to a strong offense against bad ideas. A number of types going through the realms of both art and geek culture. We've got stuff that goes into gaming, as well as uh, current events, news. They take a critical view of things and they have no problem expressing themselves very clearly. They each have their own areas of strength. And as you're going to hear, Skype was not quite treating us right. We had a delay and we were in three different locations. So I hope you'll bear with me. I'll clean it up as best I can because the content of the conversation is really good. Allison in particular was hit hard by an event that we'll go into about Calgary. Uh, Hard enough I felt bad kind of asking about it afterwards, but I'll let you listen to it and you can hear what she has to say about it. I believe that free speech is a critical pillar to our society, and I'm glad I share that in common with the Honey Badgers Brigade. Thanks for being on the show. I really enjoyed our talk, and let's get going. Here's another episode of Apostasy Now. Die well, Tilk. More than that, old friend. We die free. Because I'm very much a skeptic. More, I'm, I'm more of a skeptic than I am an atheist. I mean, atheist is a conclusion based on my skepticism. You'll have to come like a little child to the foot of the cross. That attitude is what is responsible for the rise of atheism. <laughs> That's not what Islam is all about. Islam is peace. What is the penalty for leaving the Muslim faith? With a death penalty. Thank you. This is apostasy now. For people to get the information correct before they start yap, yap, yapping. Get ready to root for the bad guys. Because with the evidence, the only evidence... Actually, our last guest we just had was uh, Dr. Randomer Cam. Yeah, I saw that. Yeah. He was a lot quieter. Oh, he? yeah, he's a lot quieter to talk to than he oh, is on yes, his videos. He is. <laughs> oh, he's such a mild person. He yeah. is so mild in person. Um, that uh, Ed, And then you see him in these like spectacular, brilliant rants on YouTube. But in person, he's just like just the sweetest, mildest human being you can imagine. Well, it made sense to me immediately well, once he told me. Uh, uh, once he told me that he studied drama. Oh, there you go. You know, he of course he he has, and of of course he's he's very very good at you know using that training for his very own person. for his own purposes. So, but um, I I might be getting a small amount of echo back. Oh, uh, you probably sure. are. It's because I can't use my headphones. Oh no. Yeah, so I'm going to mute whenever I'm not talking once we're actually recording. Okay. Uh, well, well, essentially, so you're saying you're never going to mute. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but essentially, essentially, what, what the issue is is the jack on my computer is fucked, and, uh, and I have never found a USB headphone set that will work on uh, my MacBook Air, so yeah. Yeah, we and, and the, the, jack, the jack for my headphones 
Um, I plug my headphones in and it turns the external speaker and mic off, but it doesn't do anything. It can't be bargained with. It can't be reasoned with. It doesn't feel pity or remorse or fear. And it absolutely will not stop ever until you are dead. On the other hand, uh, my old one was like four years old and I spilled wine on it. And that's when it right? uh, well, my, my older computer, since the time I was telling you about it, the one with the windows on it, my daughter puked on it <laughs> in the back seat. And uh, so that computer has been a lot less uh, useful since then. <laughs> Oh man, like honestly, like I, I, I just when I was, I was having a nap on the couch, and my, and I, you know, I had a half full glass of wine on the table, on the coffee table next to the computer, and my boyfriend woke me up, and I sat up, and the pillow knocked over oh. the glass of wine, and I just was like, oh fuck, that sucks. <laughs> yeah. Well, my just today, I had one of those moments. My daughter accidentally pulled with a towel she pulled my cell phone into the sink while she was washing her hands and drying them off oh man and i was surprised it didn't have much water in there uh, you know what was really awful was uh i was back when i was writing fiction i i had written eight thousand words of uh essentially a uh like a a battle scene where one of the main characters got like brutally killed in the most dramatic way and and then you know his his her lover uh, avenged himself, you know, on on her killers, and and essentially just like died in the most brutal. It was like you know the entirety of the movie Gladiator, you know, in eight thousand words, yeah. right? <laughs> okay, and and I'm like I'm I'm finishing writing this, and I'm just sobbing. I'm actually sobbing yeah. because these are two characters that I've like written I've, I've written like thousands and thousands of words about them and i'm like really attached to them and i'm killing them both off and i'm just like i'm bawling and my two-year-old at that time my youngest comes up and turns my fucking computer off he pushes oh. the colored button and i lost <laughs> all of it right i lost all of it because this was before you know you had auto save you didn't have auto save back then you had to actually push the little button to save right oh no and Oh my god! And I looked at him, right? And here I am, tears streaming to my my face. And I looked at him and I said, "You will never do that again." That's all I said. <laughs> and he never fucking touched the computer again. <laughs> That's a good thing for their sake. We love them so much. <laughs> so, all right, all right. So, uh, you, I'll I'll get into talking to you guys about all the work you guys have been doing. You've been very busy. <laughs> <laughs> oh according to my boyfriend i'm very very lazy oh <laughs> yeah I, I i don't really do much um but I, I think he's maybe a little bit biased because not everything i do is for him so <laughs> <laughs> but yeah no um i i've i've been doing a whole bunch of things i you know i went to vancouver and did two speeches in vancouver just uh this uh in november and um, I've, uh, did another one, uh, just in Edmonton, just a, a week or so ago. So yeah, I've, I've, I've been busy doing things and I have actually have a couple of, uh, videos that I really need to get done, um, that are, uh, outlining specific legal cases, uh, sort of the third installment of the Gregory Allen Elliott case that's going down in Toronto. And then there's another one, uh, that's involving, the, that, that's the Twitter one, right? The Twitter harassment yeah. trial. Yeah. Yes. And then there's another video that I need to do involving a uh, an, uh, a man in Norway who was accused of, falsely accused of rape. And uh, that entire story, that story is just like the most unbelievably, like I, you couldn't write a novel about it and make yeah. it believable, right? That just what this this guy has gone through and and for what? He was a Lothario, right? You know, he, he, he liked, he liked the ladies, right? He was yeah. a, uh, a man from South America, right? Who was studying in Norway and, and he was, he was very, very successful with the ladies and it bit him in the ass and so, spent two years in jail waiting a trial that never happened because they eventually dropped the charges. What? Are you serious? So, two yeah. years waiting for it to start? Yeah. Waiting for the trial to start and then they eventually dropped the charges. That's amazing. I believe. 
I believe he is about to receive monetary compensation for that. I should hope. Yeah. So, but essentially, it was it was it was essentially a case of um, of him. Uh, he he was an unabashed, unapologetic uh, ladies' man, and the ladies that he uh, dallied with didn't like that. You know that he couldn't be. You know that when he said, "Yeah, no, you, you you can buy my you can buy sex and you can buy my attention, but you can't buy my love." Like it was literally a case of a gigolo being accused of rape by the women who were paying him to have sex with him. That's yeah. Well, I know a lot of uh, Western developed nations, in particular, uh, the response is. Uh, always take her seriously, but not just take her seriously, assume that she's telling the truth. And uh, I hope that uh, there's more and more of these cases that uh, people, you know, a lot of guys that are having their lives destroyed, continue to sue, you know, states, different departments in the government for accusing them and then treating them like they're guilty automatically without proper process. I, I would agree. I, I, I really, really hope that there are more cases. There are there are lots of cases, over 50 lawsuits in the U.S. right now, over 50 legal actions um, spurring from uh, university kangaroo courts that uh, that expel young men on, you know, a 50.01% burden of proof with no due process protections available and no evidence gathering, no right to subpoena on the part of the body that's doing it, no 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 forensics being done just um just essentially a, a panel of of professors and faculty and yeah. and even students who who just get to sit in judgment over two people in a hearing um and and what they say uh and and with and some of the the guidance that they have you know the uh the one handbook uh training handbook training manual that was given out at the believe it was the University of Michigan um system was uh was that if a man who is a defendant is uh is angry or defensive that's probably a sign of his guilt but if he's logical and persuasive that's probably also a sign of his guilt right and so essentially it's like this kafkaesque thing where the the training materials provided to the people who are making these decisions essentially say no matter what he does he's guilty no matter what he says no matter what he does he's probably guilty um well we're we're all in canada which is interesting for the show it usually doesn't happen that way um i don't know what it's like in different provinces exactly but i know talking to a number of people uh that you guys probably know um ontario is really bad i have been uh my uh, kind of coming into all of this online i first started out this show thinking that it would de probably deal a lot with discussions around atheism or skepticism more specifically. But because of the skepticism, you know, angle, the way my life was going and same with my co-host who can't be here today. Uh, but when he is here, he's training for social work. We both each on our own felt dragged in more and more to this discussion about soci social ideology, specifically this kind of um, belief that uh, feminism, uh, the ideological feminism is it, that they have this great truth and the reality of this great truth is that it's destroying lives by the millions, uh, just just ruining people's lives. Uh, when I went into the court system myself, uh, I was continually shocked stage after stage at how lethargic and biased and bigoted the system was and how the things that they say that they're doing or the reasons they're doing it don't measure up at all with any kind of consistency to how they're behaving. It's, it's right out of control. Now, I'm not, I'm not being charged with anything criminal. I'm not facing any of that, at least until my ex decides to take it to that level, <laughs> if she decides to, which is always a possibility when someone's angry. Um, oh, well, and when you have, when you have people, officials, uh, social workers, and guardians ad litem and friends of the court encouraging you to do it, yes? Yeah. Oh, yeah, I have no doubt. Like, she, she's received the benefit of the doubt. Uh, she got automatic custody, benefit of the doubt. Um, She's, uh, I'm sure, gotten all kinds of at least information, but probably financial aid of some kind um, for, you know, being a helpless woman or whatever. So just to give you an idea, um, in, in our case, there's actually a social worker the court brought in who brought out a report calling for my ex-wife to be psychologically evaluated to make sure she's safe and highlighted police reports, school reports uh, of incidences with my ex. This was almost two years ago. This report was filed with the court. Um, by the time we get into court in the spring for our next, it's not even for, even first trial, first assessment, 
uh, sorry, second assessment, which we already did one. I don't know why we're doing another one, but it's before any trial date starts. It'll be in the spring. We'll have been in the system three and a quarter, uh, three and a quarter years. So just dragging it out like that um, is meant to, according to a number of legal professionals I've spoken to, it's intentionally designed to grind the man down. Well, yeah, you, you look at you look at the um, uh, all of the all of the data that feminists will hold up and say, well, you know, here's this proof that men aren't discriminated against in family court when they actually seek custody there. They receive custody the majority of the time. Right. Well, OK, but how do you define custody? Custody can be defined as uh, sole physical custody, uh, shared physical custody, 50, 50 or 60, 40 or whatever. Right. Yeah. It can be it can be defined as like uh, my ex had joint custody of his children from his previous marriage, which amounted to every other weekend um, that he got to have them. Right. So custody uh, means essentially it's just like a meaningless term in the sense that they're trying to use it when men seek custody, when men seek sole custody in contested cases. Yes, they're awarded some custody most of the time. Right. Um, so when a man seeks sole physical custody, oh, most of the time he'll get at least every other weekend. Wow. Whoopee. Woohoo. Yeah. Right. Um, exact same studies that they use to show that the courts aren't biased against fathers actually show that when women seek sole physical custody, they are uh, awarded it 65 percent more often than men are when men seek sole phys- physical cust- custody. Right. And yeah. that's the men who actually. Uh, have have they've been already been advised by their lawyers this is going to be a long and grueling process this is going to cost you your fucking shirt this is going to take you years right and you are going to be paying through the nose and you're maybe even going to be paying for her legal expenses to to fight you on this right are you really willing to do it and those men who have said yes i am willing to do it because my ex-wife is that unfit right yeah they still are less likely to gain sole physical custody than the women. Yeah, I. It, it's absolutely, it's it's absolutely insane. Uh, it, it's insane. It's insane. I've had this discussion even with my own lawyer, though he represents me in court. You know, he actually represents me outside of court. We've gotten a couple times sidetracked into philosophical discussions about what is or isn't a human rights violation and whether the court is actively engaged in violating human rights, which I believe it is. Uh, when I am, you know, like I said, we've, we've been separated now for almost three years. My ex only a few months ago started to even pretend she was looking for a job and we're not old, you know, she's been told by one judge, uh, finally, you know, you need to get a job followed up by another judge that destroyed me financially with a decision on her, on her behalf. So the message clearly is to her, just keep trying to sit on your butt and do nothing. This guy might have to pay for you the rest of his life. You know, why not take the chance? There's this all have to pay for you because of wage gap. Wage gaps, right. Her, you know, justification is, of course. Well, between her and I, there is a huge wage gap, as in I earn one, and she does not. <laughs> yeah, but that's the thing. I mean, they'll continue to justify um, this kind of bias towards women because, you know, wage gap. Men are, or women are disenfranchised in society. No, actually, wage gap usually, uh, a lot of cases throughout history, wage gap is an indication of one particular group being enfranchised over another um, because they can earn less and still survive. And usually that's because the government is giving money from one group to put give to the other group. Yeah. <laughs> so I always find that funny, that argument funny, but I apologize <laughs> for interrupting the concrete <laughs> that you guys were discussing for something a little bit more. No, that's fine. Oh, oh, no, it's absolutely it's absolutely true though. Yeah. What what Allison is saying is that is that when <clears throat> when you look at it and the the justifications for favoring the mother um, that you know as far as sole physical custody uh, goes, it, it is it, a lot of it does have to do with the fact that the man is the wage earner and the woman is the wage receiver, and so you know we should just keep that going, right? And I mean, I have known men. There's one uh, who I very, very briefly dated, and I had a look at his uh, his divorce papers, and he thought he thought <laughs> silly freaking rabbit. He thought that he would be uh, he would be free after 17 years. He was married to her for 15 years, and he was forced in his agreement, his his divorce settlement, to pay her alimony. Um, for 17 years. Well, it was it was essentially he's supposed to pay her this amount of child support and this amount of alimony. 
Okay, but there's a clause in that divorce agreement saying that if there is any material change to anybody's income, then the the agreement is null and void. It it can be reopened. Yeah. Blah blah blah. Yeah. Right. And and he has to pay. So so he's like, okay, my daughter is going to turn eighteen pretty quick, and then I'm going to be free from. I'm I'm gonna I'm only going to be paying alimony. And I'm like, are you fucking kidding me? No, because then she's going to say I've had a material a material financial change of circumstances and now I want to reopen it and I want to get the alimony increased to what the child support plus alimony was right and then when you hit that 17 years of being divorced where you think you're free she's gonna all of a sudden have zero money coming in and she's gonna say oh I've had a material financial change of circumstances yep. and I want to reopen the question of whether he still owes me money right and the whole time, the whole time, the, the government, the provincial government in this province in BC <coughs> essentially looks at it and says, says alimony is supposed to be temporary. The, the spouse receiving alimony is supposed to be taking positive steps toward becoming self-sufficient, right? That's yeah. what they are. That's their obligation to do that. This woman has never been held up as obligated to do that. She has always just been a passive recipient. And the one time, the one time he actually, he actually got her a job, right? A job that she could do. And she went to work and she worked for like five months. And then he emailed her and said, <coughs> um, he said, uh, I'm having problems making my rent right now because times are hard and the business isn't doing as well as it was and blah, blah, blah. And the very first thing she did was quit her job. Yeah. yeah. That, that's exactly the type of attitude I'm talking about. If you're, if you're unfit, it, when, especially when it comes to, like, this is, this is part of the confusion. Spousal, spousal support and child support are supposed to be two distinct issues. And they are continually mashed together in the court under the term in the child's best interest, which is their moniker to, to excuse any behavior, no matter how wrong it is. Um, you know, it, it absolutely is. It's, it's essentially, um, if, 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 even if you're paying the, the amount of child support that, that you, you know, that is applicable through the child support calculator, right. Yeah. Um, if you're not paying the alimony, the kids are going to suffer. Right. So essentially it's, it's basically a ticket for women, um, certain women to, to never have to actually learn to be self-supporting. Well, and I, I think that the public generally assumes, cause they don't like to think about it. I think there's a big amount of assumption that goes on that. Okay. In my case, we were married four years. We were together three of those four, but we'll just say the full four years. And we have been separated for three. Uh, I am still paying her spousal support. Uh, she's, you know, she doesn't suffer from a debilitating disease. Uh, she's tried to make excuses and the court has said that none of this is relevant to not getting a job. And yet no, nothing's done on her side. The only thing that the court has continually done is made sure that they're taking my money and giving it to her. That's the only priority they seem to have had at any stage. Yeah. No, they're not going to tell her to go get a job at Tim Hortons, you know, making making paninis and, and serving donuts and coffee. They're not going to tell her to do that. Right. Right. right? And, and frankly, like as somebody who's working class, who worked as a, as a cook and a waitress um, and who was self-supporting and supporting three kids without child support, or without government programs, without the subsidies, I would get the notices from the Alberta government and stuff like that saying, you're eligible for this, you're eligible for that. Yeah. And I was just like, no, um, I can, I can pay for my own kids. Um, no, it, 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 it really disgusts me. The number of women who are willing to actually say, you know what? I just don't feel like working because as a yeah. waitress, as a fucking waitress working minimum wage, I was able to support three kids. Well, I, I have known a couple of guys who they got uh, someone pregnant when they were younger. Uh, so I'm, I'm going to be 39 this month. Uh, so my friends, when they were much younger, coming out of high school, early 20s, um, they got someone pregnant and they went on to welfare. They stopped what they were doing, went on welfare. And they never got threatened. I've already gotten three notices for prison. <laughs> you know, uh, I'm not a criminal. I, I've done nothing wrong. Uh, I was paying the support that they eventually ordered me to pay on my own before the court process even started. Uh, I've tried and... Uh, you know, meet all these kind of expected obligations that I thought were already unreasonable, but I figured I might as well do it on my own because it's going to happen anyways. Uh, but as I had to change my job so I could have custody because I'm an over, I was an over the road truck driver. So my income dropped. You can't get the same wages when you're going to be there for your kids as a truck driver. And that chart that they like to talk about so much, 
uh, about income that they're supposed to use for support calculations was bypassed by him impugning me an income. That's what the judge calls it, impugning you with an income. Oh, yeah. No, you, you're imputed an income. And, and the judge did the exact same thing with my ex when we were doing our final negotiations because there was no way that a judge would have signed off on our divorce without a child support order in place. And he wasn't working when we were divorcing. And the judge essentially said, we demanded, like, because my lawyer said no judge is going to actually ever agree to sign this document if there's no child support order. And the child support order has to be based on something. So what we're going to base it on is minimum wage 35 hours a week, right? That's what we're going to base it on. And that's going to be his imputed income. And the judge will have to be satisfied with that. Now, my ex was capable of earning more, um, you know, if all the planets aligned and and his lucky stars were, you know, in a ray above yeah. him. Yeah. Um, he was he was capable of earning significantly more than that. But we we essentially we just went with the absolute lowest figure for what we considered to be an adult who was out working full time. Right. Yeah. The absolute minimum of what what that person could be expected to earn. And. I have never actually taken any steps to collect that because he's been he's been having issues with his health and he's been having all kinds of problems with just other things in his life, right? That have made his income even when he's, you know, even when he's earning good money, it may only be for 2 or 3 months and then then it's nothing for 3 months right? Then he's living off of what he managed to scrape together and, and save up while he was working. That, that's, that's his life, right? And I'm not going to uh, put him in a position where he has to, um, he has to actually uh, face prison for being unable to sustain even just himself, right? That, that's absolutely absurd and it's ridiculous. Not when I have the ability to look after my kids without external help and support. Yeah. Right. Well, it's, it's it's a ridiculous thing to do. Now, as an MRA, I'd love to see male victims of domestic violence receive the same care and assistance that female victims do. I'd like to see cases of common couple violence. Well, remember, they're typically reciprocal and usually sporadic or temporary. Um, be treated through counseling rather than sort of an enforcement of permanent family separation. I'd like to see men with children have better options than, one, risk a kidnapping charge, two, leave the kids alone with a violent woman, or three, stay and swallow the abuse. I'd like to see men who call the police for help have a better chance of being helped than arrested, instead of the other way around, like it is now. So, all of you feminists who complain that all MRAs do is attack feminism, you tell me, right? Just tell me. How do I make these things happen without attacking feminism? You know, the ideology that applied patriarchy theory to domestic violence came up with the Duluth model, wrote it into law and policy, and now zealously guards it from any criticism. How do I convince lawmakers and bureaucrats and directors of agencies to abandon a model built on the ideologies of feminism without ever mentioning the word feminism, without ever uttering the words, feminists got it wrong? This is this is why I say the court treats me like I'm subhuman. Uh, they would never send her for any reason. They'd never send her notice. Do what we're telling you, or you know, we're going to send you to prison. They can send that to me. Just you know, uh, I should probably give just enough details so you understand that uh, the court decision that happened um, last spring went back to 2012's income when I was over the road and I was almost never home. That's the most I've ever made ever in my life. And they use that as a basis to compare to my new income, which is an hourly job, local, because I can't even afford my own car anymore. And he put my income into the middle, which is $50,000 a year. And I don't make nearly that. So the result has been that my parents give me shelter and help me eat while I continue to work as a professional driver and get told that I'm still more in debt than the maximum amount they can take off my check. So it's obviously completely insane. And you'd think that somewhere in the system, there'd be an emergency lever at FRO, you know, the, the, the organization in the government that's supposed to do all of this, all of the collections and threats. You'd think that if they could only take maximum half of your check and they still weren't even getting near to what they're supposed to be supposedly taking, 
that they'd have like an alarm switch to pull. Like, hey, someone needs to come and review this situation before we end up destroying someone's life without any good reason. But uh, no need to do that. I'm just a man. Yeah. <laughs> oh, one of the one of the most uh, atrocious things that I ever read. I read, and I forget what state it was. And God, I wish I'd kept the article bookmarked. Um, it was about a state in the U.S. where they had um, they had decided to go from issuing paper checks to uh, people who receive state benefits to uh, direct deposits. And what this uh, what happened in the wake of this decision, and it was saved the state billions of dollars a year, millions of dollars a year, right? Um, what happened in the wake of this decision was that there were people, there were men who were on disability, right? Who whose checks, whose paper checks could be garnished up to 80%, right? To right. pay arrears right. on child support for children who were now 25, 27 years old, right? In one case, the dad was actually living with his adult son, being supported by him, right? By his adult son that he was repaying all this child, back child support for, right? And But the, the issue is that the government can only take 80% of a check, but it can take 100% oh. of what's in your bank account, right? So essentially what these people on disability, what these, what they had been doing was they would get their paper check. They would go to, not to a bank and deposit it. They would go to a check cashing place and they would get their 20% of their disability benefits that the government left them with, that the child support agency allowed them to, to keep for themselves. And they would not be a complete and utter burden on their own children who this child support is supposedly going to benefit, Right. They would they would do that, but now because it's all going to be direct deposited, the government, the child support agent agency, can take one hundred percent of every dollar that hits their bank account. So they are left with nothing. So they are entirely living as as financial burdens on their adult children, who, who the government is claiming this child support money from them to pay for these children who are twenty seven years old. Right. And none of that money's going to the children. None of that money's even going to the mothers. It's going to repay the state for benefits that were paid out to the mother in welfare and WIC and food stamps and programs and all kinds of stuff that she took advantage of when her kids were children. Right. Yeah. It's yeah. all going to pay the state back for that. Well, I mean, this is this is what I don't understand. I've had this discussion before where. Um, uh, when it comes up with, you know, sh my ex obviously is trying to tell the, the court her cry stories about she has a few problems, you know, like her wrist gets sore. Uh, she, you know, she heard it at a job. Wow. And uh, what was the other one? She has, um, it's an intestinal condition that can cause you problems at times. Crohn's? It's not IBS. Uh, it's not, it doesn't go by either of those. It's, it's not as extreme as Crohn's. There's another term for it. And I know doctors have, have said that she has this problem, but it only acts up every Irritable so bowel syndrome? Yeah, it goes under that general category, but there's a there's a technical name for it. If I said it, you would recognize it, but for some reason, it's not, it's not popping in my head. But anyways, it's not life threatening, and it's not uh, considered a disability by a, any stretch. There are times you might miss work because you're in pain, and you might need to take some time off. But it's um, at any rate, the court recognized it, and they're like, that's you know. And here I am, continually going to a job where I get sore shoulders, sore elbows, sore knees, sore feet. Um, uh, sore back. A lot of people do. And you know what we do? We work. <laughs> I mean, when it gets too bad, you might need to take some time off, but yeah, she's just like, Oh, I'm not perfectly comfortable all the time. I shouldn't have to work. <laughs> uh, and um, my response yeah, is, no, it, that, that always, that always what? struck me as weird. My response is if, if it's so bad that it's a disability, then she should apply, well, apply to the government and they'll give her disability. Otherwise, why should I pay you disability for something the government won't? Like, you know, like this makes, this is insanity. Agreed. The same... Agreed. It's, it's like, it's like, um, it, it's, it's, there's a sense of entitlement that I've found among younger, uh, kids that I work with, right. That, oh, I'm not going to do that because, you know, I don't like doing that. Right. Even though it's part of the job description. And I'm like, y you realize that if you liked doing your work, you'd be paying us to do it. Right. Yeah. <laughs> we wouldn't, we wouldn't be paying you. You'd be paying us. Yeah. So. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, my job that I do is not like my dream job. I do it because I'm a father. You know, I I care about my kid, and I would naturally expect that a parent who has a child would work, and to some extent, we all sacrifice 
to care for our kids. I, it doesn't seem to me like a, a shocking revelation or an epiphany. It just seems kind of like what most people do. Agreed. Agreed. Um, Allison, you're not talking much. Talk some more. Well, the thing is that I don't have a heck of a lot specific to say about this. I mean, this is more your area of expertise. Mine is more theoretical systems and, and well, stuff. It's, well, yeah. it's, it's connected. That's... Let's let's move into something like, like that. All right. Okay. Because they are connected. Well. I know that you guys... Um, of course. You guys do take a stand for freedom of expression. Um, and, of course, there's a very fa- <laughs> famous incident uh, there at, the, at Calgary. Um for anyone who's listening to my show who is living under a rock or just isn't in our circles, would you guys give me a, just a brief idea of what happened there? Do you want me to, or do you want to, Karen? No, 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 you go ahead. It's it's your, at Calgary Expo was your baby. It was your comic. <laughs> it was your seven years of work. So, um, yeah. Okay, well, so I actually, the, 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 the story of this sort of starts earlier. Um, I had been creating a comic book uh, since about, 2009 and uh and i had been even at that point in time i had wanted to go to the calgary expo so this has been sort of seven years in the making to um to sell my comic um and uh you know life just sort of intervened i i had to finish my um master's of design and that took a lot of time because i had i had i have health issues that i have to manage and um when it was finally done, um, I, I ended up, uh, what, what ended up happening was when I graduated um, from, from university with my master's in design, I went into, um, I sort of, uh, you know what, that, that's, that's irrelevant. That's all personal stuff. Anyway, I would, I, it took me a while to get back to the idea of going to the Calgary Expo and selling my comic. And uh, I, I, I started by going to a local convention, local anime convention, um, and, uh, and, and that went, it went okay. I, I got some interest from some pros in the, the comics industry who said that I had really good price pacing, which was a great shot in the arm for, uh, shot, you know, for, for, for confidence. Yeah. Um, and then I decided to go to, uh, the, Sa- the Saskatoon, Sa- this was in 2014. Uh, I decided to go to the Saskatoon Expo, um, and try my hand there. And I did pretty well. I, I actually, uh, what happened is I did it. I had a booth under Honey Badger Radio at the Sask Expo. Um, I don't think that Karen actually knows this. And I brought up Sage Gerard to help me with sales and just, just as a friend and in a capacity as a friend. And so we did, we did actually pretty well. I think we sold something like 70, between 35 and 40 books, which was pretty good. Um, nice. I mean, at, at that time I was considering maybe downgrading to an artist alley booth, which would be more, less, less expensive. And probably the people in it would be more about supporting local artists and, and people doing their own little ventures. But I mean, I, I thought that was, you know, and it, it was a pretty successful convention. Um, I noticed one thing that was a little bit odd. Um, there was at least one person who came up to the booth knowing that it was the Honey Badger radio booth and he was scared to death. And he was just, and I thought it was, what, what, why are you, um, and he was saying, I'm a fan of yours and, and can, can I, can I have a pin? And he took a pin and he fled. I'm like, weird. Okay. That was a little weird. <laughs> I, were I you, didn't really, were you waving around actually... a machine gun or something? <laughs> no, no, not at all. We were just, uh, we were just in our little corner off in the middle of nowhere, basically just talking to the people who walk by and, uh, and selling comic books. And I actually talked to another comic book creator. I think it was rock, 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 paper, um, uh, Sarka or something rock, paper, scissors. No shotgun, rock, paper, shotgun. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> How the heck do you know that? And I didn't, I just, um, uh, <laughs> okay, don't worry, Karen. They're, they're they're a website, aren't they? Yes, they're a website. And so I was talking to the guy who, behind that, the mastermind behind that, and we were we were talking about uh, you know the the politics that we talk about on Honey Badger Radio, and and I think at that time we were talking a little bit about Gamergate, and he was like, you know, I'm I'm really mostly in social justice warrior type, and I'm like, okay, well, I'm not going to bite your head off because of that, but I mean, I will challenge you on your beliefs, but and then he said, but you know. I'm more scared of them than I am of you uh, and you guys. <laughs> ah. And I'm like, uh, yeah, maybe that should tell you something, you know, um, maybe that should, maybe that should clue you in. if you're terrified to run with the people that, you know, share your beliefs. But anyway, I don't know how much trouble I've just given him from that, but he, <laughs> uh, you know, social justice warriors. No, uh, um, actually he is a totally like, I mean, totally verifiable died in the real, real uh, wood, wool social justice warrior. He, he only had those moments of waffling and it was all my fault because I'm evil. So yes. don't, don't take it out on him. Don't take it out on him. 
Okay. W's leave him alone. Leave yes. him alone. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so that, know, that went well. You know they treat the, their own that that don't toe the line even worse than the others. It's kind of like any any religion when someone tries to splinter off, uh, they are deemed heretics and hunted down. Yeah, well, I mean they'll treat they'll treat anyone who they deem to have some power over, some moral authority over, like shit. Um, and uh, it's just a matter of time if you're part of that group. Yeah. Um, because it won't group. broke any distance, distance, and it and the thing is that this that the the, the the path you have to walk it's narrower and narrower. Yeah. So it's it's just a matter of time. But anyway, so it was it was a, it was a fun convention. We did well. I thought I did. We did really well. And uh, so I I'm I actually had purchased that booth at the same time as I purchased the Calgary Expo. So I was sort of really freaking excited for the Calgary Expo. And then I started to do the planning for that. And I was like, okay, I'm going to do like an installation because I'm, I'm a sort of also an installation artist. Um, and uh, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do like this installation. I'm going to have a backdrop. I'm going to have like some LED space funnel, which was really cool. And I, it was, I, it was, to me, like that's just. It was, I, it, was, it was a fucking awesome booth. Thank yes. you, Karen. It was an unbelievable installation. I, like I, I just, yeah, no, it was. Like I saw, and and I was there when all of this shit was being delivered, and then and, and <laughs> Allison and her husband were trying to like uncrate it and sort of semi set it up at home, you know, and and see how the pieces all fit together. And I was just like, what the fuck is all this shit, right? <laughs> and and then it all came together in the booth, and I was like, holy fuck, this is awesome. Th- this rocks. This is like totally cool. Yeah. Nice. yeah. Well, it was really exciting. Um, and like I said, I'm an installation artist. So the idea of people going into my, I could consider it like an artwork and enjoying it like that and being inspired by it is actually really thrilling. So I do tend to get a little bit crazy with that kind of thing. But anyway, so we, we, we set it up. It, it took, a, it took us, uh, it is, I was excited to get to the uh, Alberta call, um, Expo, or sorry, Calgary Expo. And and I had been planning it for several months, the installation. And um, so it, it, about a month before, um, I decided to do a fundraiser. And the reason why I did it a month before is because generally the time crunch tends to make people be more eager about actually paying for stuff or, or, or offering contributions. I, I think Karen knows what I'm talking about. It's like yeah, it, you know, when, if you, when, you, when you get down to the deadline, that's when people actually um, start really – um, going, oh my God, they're not going to make their goal. Uh, yeah. Here's some money. Right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So if, that's, if, that's, that's, that's how that works. Right. So, so starting a, a fundraiser sort of fairly close to the, it, it, you always have to really juggle um, the probabilities, uh, you know, as far as when you want to start a fundraiser versus when the deadline is. Right? Yeah. And, and you can yeah. And for, you know, so it's, it's sometimes better to put it closer to the deadline. So people have that sense of urgency and excitement. Um, and so I, I did that. I started the, the the fundraiser to get the rest of Honey Badger Brigade to the fund or to the to the expo. Um, and uh, at the time, at the time that I started the fundraiser, my, the the booth was registered under Zenospora. Um, and the reason why was because I wasn't entirely sure what was going to happen with the fundraiser, if people were that interested in getting us to a Calgary Expo. And if it sort of petered out, then, then there was, would be really no point to saying that the Honey Badger Brigade was there. Um, but the fundraiser did really well. And um, when, when we were funded, um, I updated the website, or I updated um, Calgary Expo with the new information about us, the Honey Badger yeah. Brigade being there. So I updated the um, the booth with that, and it it ended up being printed on all of our placards, uh, or on the booth placard, on all of our our badges, on the like the the map, and so they had they knew that we were going to be there. And the other thing is that they also knew since like October, no September 2014, who I was. They knew about Honey Badger Radio and the connection with Zenospora and the connection with Honey Badger Brigade. Yeah. So it's it's sort of it, like the, the the I mean the same guy who who dealt with the the exhibit coordinator the exhibit coordinator for Calgary Sask Expo is I'm pretty sure the same guy who does Calgary Expo. So I don't think I changed the email address that I I contacted for all of this, and so um, I mean. And yes, there was some sarcastic stuff on the on on the funding site about infiltrating the convention, but that was a joke. Yes, <laughs> it was a joke. I don't actually think that I am a space leper. Okay, <laughs> okay, but obviously some people believe that you are indeed a space leper because 
yeah. <laughs> yeah. What happened? Because because there really is the space leprosy. It, it's a thing that happened. It's a thing that exists. Um, so <laughs> what happened was uh, we we went there on Wednesday, I believe, to set up. Um, and it took about me and my husband about four. So I think it's maybe between four and five hours to set up the booth. And so we set it up. Um, and then uh, the, everybody else arrived because people were coming in by plane. And they popul the, the Honey Badger Brigade sort of populated the booth. <laughs> I don't know how else to describe it. Um, infiltrated it. <laughs> infiltrated the booth. You penetrated your booth, Alice. <laughs> and and it. What, was, what was really interesting is we were actually directly across from the customer service for the Calgary Expo the entire time. Um, and <laughs> so the booth was up for Thursday. Um, we opened it up on time. Um, we were ready to greet the public. Nothing untoward happens. Thursday was a real like it was like a sneak peek day, so it was really really quiet. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, it was just like a half day. Yeah, it was a half day. So people wandered by and and we said hi and we talked. Um, didn't give you know like uh, didn't give too much politics in in the actual place, but said you know we're we're we are slightly controversial. We're for freedom of speech. We talk about issues other people won't. If you're interested in checking us out, blah blah blah. The, the spiel and then sold comic books. And um, then uh, me and Sage saw that uh, they had a woman into comics panel, and we decided to attend it. And uh, oh, oh, yeah, we also put up a GamerGate flag because GamerGate were some of the people's people who got us there. Yes. Yeah. Um, so we wanted to do that as a thank you. Yeah. Um, Stand up and, for, free, for free speech. Stand yeah. Up for free speech, ethics, and journalism. GamerGate. Oh, that yeah. sounds so horrible. So um, <laughs> I, I, and in. Yeah, it was terrible. They were <laughs> terrible fucking people. But um, so that morning, Hannah overheard um, someone talking. And she didn't actually think she did. She was pretty spooked, but uh, she wasn't completely sure if they were joking or not. But she overheard an Expo staff member and an, another member of, she assumed, the public waving towards the booth, but in like the general direction, like not not necessarily specifically. Um, and um, saying, we got to shut some of these booths down. And she didn't, she, so she brought that information back to us and we were like, whoa, okay, um, well, let's talk to the customer service people. And we went over and we talked to the customer service people and I said, uh, is everything okay? Um, I know that some of our materials might be deemed, you know, controversial. Did, did you, is it okay? And he said, yes, everything is fine. So in other words, when we asked the expo, if there was a problem, they assured us there wasn't every single time we asked. Yeah. Um, and uh, and so we, we continued on with our day, except we got a little bit more concerned and we started to record ourselves just in case. Probably um, a wise precaution. Uh, that was that was under. Yeah. Well, that was under Hannah's suggestion. And Hannah and I think also Sage suggested it. Um, so me and Sage saw that there was a women into comics panel and we decided to attend it and uh, see, see what was up. And um, and we were at that point in time, we were doing the, our recording. And uh, so we went to the panel, um, you know, they, they, they did their spiel and, you know, to be quite honest, about 15 minutes in, it looked like they were sort of floundering for something to say. Uh, and then they brought up, we don't know why these anti-feminists or, or men's rights activists don't want feminism, I think. In, I, I don't know. The yeah, exact something like they that. Said, but they, something they, said like that. Some, they said something about, I don't know why it's become like so horrible that women like comics, according to these men's rights activists. Right. And it's like, I don't think that there's any men's rights activist who is like uh, chagrined or upset that, that women uh, in general like comics. Um, but yeah, that, that's sort of what they and, and they were they were like, why? Why is this? You know, why is this such a problem with these men's rights activist types? Right. And then you stood up and yeah, yeah, I said I stood up because I'm like five foot two, so uh, like five, or, or maybe on a good day. And so if I don't stand up, nobody can freaking hear me. But anyway, I stood up and I said, um, "Do you want me to field that question?" And like I said, at that point in time, it sounded like they were floundering for more content, <laughs> um, uh, or they're having they were yeah. It, it, so I was like, okay, well, you know, let let's 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 introduce introduce a discussion. Yeah. So, uh, or, or introduce a new, new, new point of view here. Um, and, and I said, essentially, you know, I don't, I don't like feminism. I'm a men's rights activist. I don't like feminism. I said, oh, and I said, you can hate on me, but anyway, that, that was just <laughs> me being, you know, me. Um, and, uh, and I said, That's um, aggressive, but also truthful because they did hate on you, didn't they? Oh my goodness. Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> it was well, like you had yeah. foresight. <laughs> 
<laughs> but it's also like you know just just yeah well not enough apparently <laughs> um so i said uh um you know the reason why i don't like feminism is you present women as victims um and um and i think that's not a good thing for first of all because it, it it ignores the fact that men are also victims but also because it casts women as victims um and you need to challenge both and uh and we and there was like we, we went back and forth a bit after that and then there was a discussion and after i spoke nobody else asked to speak they just started shout you just you know they were just like i'm going to talk and and they just spoke at the panel like they didn't even uh, they didn't even raise their hand or anything they just shouted out whenever they wanted to and they weren't like shouting out like angrily or anything but they were certainly not not uh, yeah. not being quiet and um the only person who raised their hand actually was sage it was like everybody in the audience was just piping up and he's he was waiting with his hand up for like half an hour it was actually really interesting i wish they would have released that videotape because you would have seen all that well anything... but i don't think they did i don't think they ever released the video videotape yeah. of that particular panel but um that's just that word where, where what has happened what, what at what point that all of a sudden did, did it become a dirty thing for women to be into this stuff like in the eyes of so many of these men's rights activist types or would you like us to field that question huh? would you like us to field that question because sure. i am a men's rights activist so you can okay. you can hate on me the reason why i don't like feminism is because you promote this idea that women are defined by being victims if you look at the context of all of your issues men also face considerable problems as well and they need to be brought into the story and not just for men's sake because this hides men's vulnerability also for the sake of challenging the notion that women are defined as victims if it makes them look bad or goes um, against but, their their thing they probably have no incentive to release it uh probably not although you would think that um at the very least Mary Sue, before reporting, reporting on all this, would have asked to see the videotape, but regardless. Yeah. Um, so we, we thought it was, it was, we thought it went well. We thought we had, it was a like, nice discussion. Um, afterwards, I thought it was pretty good. Um, and then we left and we, we ended up talking with a, with a librarian for about an hour almost afterwards. She was one of the people who spoke up and talked about how people would come into her library and demand that certain books be taken off the shelves. Yeah. She was quite, uh, she was quite, uh, she was quite feisty about the issue of censorship. So we talked to her for about an hour, an hour, uh, an hour. Yeah, I think about an hour. Then we wandered back to the booth. This time it was closing time for the booth. Um, so we wandered back. I think it was like maybe 10 minutes left. So we, we packed some stuff up and uh, then we went home for the night. And, uh, and at some point, I think the Mary, the editor for the Mary Sue tweeted about how if there's men's rights activists at your panel, you, you should ignore them. And then I tweeted back with a with a with a video discussion that we had had afterwards. Where well, well, some of them got some of you guys got drunk <laughs> and feisty, but yeah. Uh, and then, um, sorry, uh, I'm, I'm okay. That you're 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 making a jab at me, aren't you? <laughs> no, I'm not particularly. God damn it, Allison! My liver <laughs> is my own business. <laughs> but yeah, go on, go on. <laughs> so and then after that, um, uh, like. Uh, we we went back the next morning and uh it was just well, at one point we had heard a tweet or something and we didn't know what was going on we 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 like because even before you like because you were staying at your dad's place and and the rest of us were staying at the condo the rented condo, mm -hmm. and we heard that there were things going down before you were even at the expo mm -hmm. right we we were hearing on twitter that we were gone before any of us had arrived at the expo. Yeah, gotcha. So, so they were, so we were getting information from them, and um, so when I went up to open the 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 uh, the the booth, we were walking up the stairs, and holy crap, that was uncomfortable moment. Like it was like going into um, enemy territory. Yeah. And so we went to the booth. Um, the the booth beside us when when we set up was empty and by the time we came back to the booth they had started setting up their own booth and it actually had covered the gamergate flag so we were we actually got the stuff that they had covered and we we sort of took it down um and we were deciding what to do with it uh when i was approached by um Sean Hinkleman from the Calgary Expo and he said um that uh he would that we had to leave and this is the this is the between the time that we asked repeat 
uh, w well, at least once, might have been repeatedly, have you, or, do you have a problem? Is there a problem here? Is there something wrong? This was the first time the expo contacted us directly, was Sean Hinkleman telling, us, telling me that we had to get out. Um, and he said that we had to get out before it opened at 11. I think it was because, 10. Because, because our being booted might embarrass the expo, right? <laughs> so if, if we weren't gone before the doors opened, people might ask questions. Oh, yes. We wouldn't want people to ask any questions about anything. Just oh, yeah, no. Everyone stand in line with your money in your hands and, and whack them down the tables. I, yeah, there's, um, and Hinkleman, uh, he, he, uh, demanded that you turn off your recorder. Yeah. And he also said that he wouldn't tell me why in front of anyone else. Yeah. So he took, he took Allison off, um, and her husband managed to, you know, convince him like I'm her husband, I'm not leaving her to go with you. Right. I'm not, I'm going to stick with her. So you got to put up with me. And they allowed him to go with her off to the side where nobody could hear so they could tell her why she was being ejected, right? Because they didn't want anybody else to know. They didn't want any witnesses. They didn't want any yeah. recordings of it. They didn't want any of that, right? And here's the fucked up thing, right? Is that we found out weeks later, weeks fucking later, that there were four cops and two police vans parked outside the freaking, the, the bay doors nearest to our booth. Just in case. Wow. Just in case we didn't go peacefully. Just in case they had to, you know, just get us out in, with in cuffs. Just in case we guns. pulled out machine guns and started spraying people. <laughs> like, Say hello to my little friend. <laughs> yeah, like because we're so dangerous. We're terrorists. They had four cops and two police vans waiting at uh, the fucking bay doors. If I can just say, you know, one of the things I've been talking to a number of people about is I remember, uh, I don't know how familiar you guys are with the skeptic community or the atheist community, but before I started this show, that was the one I kind of floated around in. And I remember when the social justice warriors started banging their pots and pans and kind of ripped the, those communities apart. Um, I remember all the way along, they kept saying, oh, they're just a fringe element. You should just ignore them. Um, oh, yeah, these... yeah. Ignore them and they'll go away. Yeah, yeah, totally, yeah they'll go away totally. once there's... Just them, humor <laughs> them, just fucking, just humor them. It's all good. This is, yeah, no. this, this saying, I think, where they say freedom, uh, the cost of freedom is of eternal vigilance. I think people have this oversimplistic idea that that just means a military. It means you have to fight bad ideas with good ideas. You need to be aware of where this destructive kind of poison enters into society and degrades things and turns things even upside down. And freedom of expression, you know, these people might seem like this is a perfect example. They might, a lot of people's reaction was mixed on whether the organization that we're talking about right now and their behavior whether this should be seen in terms of freedom of speech, because uh, they are primarily a private organization. But the social implications is what I'm always trying to, to key people in on. This is happening because there is a changing of social values that this company thinks that this is the way to make money or save money, at the very least, is to shut down freedom of expression for anything that goes against the accepted order or what is the, the great truth of the time. Uh, it, it might seem yeah. small here and there, but it adds up to a big uh, title shape or uh, title no, shift. Like, like, like political correctness as practiced under communism is a top down thing. But in our society, it's uh, it's top down, bottom up, all ends against the middle. That That's what it is. It is every single aspect of, of our society. So it's not just um, legal punishments like what Gregory Allen Elliott is going through. It's also social punishments like what Tim Hunt and, and Matt Taylor went through. It's it's uh, it's uh, essentially it's and, and it's supported sort of from the top down. Justin Trudeau saying Gamergate is a hate movement. <laughs> and then also from the bottom up with these we're oppressed people and we say Gamergate is a hate movement. Right. It's 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 from all sides. Right. Um, supporting a specific narrative. Right. And it. It doesn't necessarily have any uh, bearing on what is the actual truth, right? Well, the the very fact that they thought that, well, you know, the, what the 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 reason they gave was that there were some unhappy tweets. Was that the actual reason they said? Yeah, there was. Uh, okay, well, well, let's get back to Sean Hinkleman and <laughs> okay. taking me aside. Um, he said um, there were multiple things that he said. He said that um, 
we had to leave because of uh, mean tweet or sorry, not mean tweets, but a bunch of uh, Twitters. She said about 20 to 20, 25 or 24 or something uh, tweets had been sent to the Calgary Expo concerned about our booth. And um, and uh, let me let me try to get back into that headspace. Um, um, we didn't necessarily argue with him too much. I just said, well, did you, did you verify, like, did you, what, did you verify their accusations? And, and then, uh, they went and they, or he said, um, you know, I'm just fucking, I, I think I might be too tired, <laughs> but, um, he said, uh, well, if you can't remember the details, he said that there were 20 to 25, there, there were 20 to 25 uh, accusations of us harassing panelists. Um, that yes. through on social media, and that this this was essentially why we were being ejected is is because we were harassing people, right? Wow. And yeah, no, and it, what what got me with the whole thing was that um, my only interactions with anybody at Calgary Expo, other than to you know compliment somebody's artwork at a booth or or whatever, was to uh, to walking back to the booth with one of those bags of the mini donuts, the warm off the freaking fryer mini donuts, um, being like, Oh my God, these mini donuts, Holy shit. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Buddy was, who was walking by, Oh my God, these are God. These are, these are so good. And then to lend our, um, our neighbors a pen. Um, that, that was the extent of my interaction with people at the expo. Um, we were pretty much sticking to ourselves. We did not, um, like people approached our booth, uh, even the people who you would think were fans because they bought or gamer gators or whatever, because they bought merchandise specific to that. Um, they didn't really stick around and chat. <clears throat> they didn't want to. They didn't want to be seen as sticking around and chatting. Um, <clears throat> so we were, we were like being very, very low key. And, and this also goes to this whole, uh, the, the, you know, we're infiltrating and, and we're, we're going in, in stealth mode and all of this stuff. Well, of course, right. Stealth mode means, uh, you don't make waves. You don't do anything wrong. You, you be on your best behavior all the time and you do whatever you can to fit in other than maybe one or two things like, you know, having a Gamergate banner. Right. Yeah. Other than well, that, th other than th that, we were on. We were probably the best behaved fucking people at that fucking convention. Well, the thing is that stealth mode was a complete joke. Like I wasn't. There was no fucking content. But, there was no actual like on. Like there was nothing. I thought at the, same, people... at the same time. At the same time, everywhere we go, we're super low key. Everywhere we go, where we feel that there's any any kind of conflict, any kind of where we might not be welcome, what do we do? We're like we are on our best behavior. We are absolutely, you know, like no rape jokes allowed. No freaking off color. Nothing. No nothing that could ever that could get us booted out. We will be on our best behavior. We're gonna have cameras rolling in the booth the whole time. We're gonna be wearing cameras, you know, to make sure that you know we didn't do we didn't do nothing. We didn't do nothing. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, to me, to be honest, I didn't I, until Hannah came back from and told us about this. Um, I didn't actually, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't actually feel like. I was in any a situation where I was under siege or anything. It's not quite as bad as I think that that, or at least I wasn't approaching it in the way that we had to wear cameras. We didn't actually wear cameras. Um, I was just I I I didn't think that this would happen. To be honest, um, I don't know what I thought. Well, and for the people, um, I uh, well, and for people who think that uh, this is just an isolated incident, because like I I know I'm not the only one who made a big deal about it. I was recording. Uh, my interview with Dean Esme that day, and we delayed it a couple hours because this was just happening to you guys that day. And the next day, I did my interview with Mike Aru. And, you know, I know I'm not the only one who said, like, that this is uh, something we're taking note of, something's really wrong here. Um, look at what's going on in the universities now, especially in the States, but in here, you know, in Canada as well, that you have a bunch of people who are now actually saying out loud, freedom of expression doesn't matter. In other words, you know, this assumption that if someone's saying something that they are in quotations not supposed to say or in quotations is bad, uh, whatever, um, that they should be able to be silenced. This is something that I am finding disturbing that it's reaching out further and further into the public. Oh yeah, no, and even if you even if you look at um, that whole thing with the dentistry students at um, in uh, what was it Nova Scotia, 
right? Yeah. Um, that, that was a private fucking Facebook page. That was a private Facebook page. People, like, literally, should we have cameras in and and recording devices in men's locker rooms now yeah so that they don't like you know when yeah. start comparing you know like the size of their dicks we can we can like you know censure them and, <laughs> and make them not have jobs anymore like i really really is is that where we're going that people can't even in a private conversation where they feel like they're free to speak to just go over the top yeah. go over the top here's your 40 well, 40 pound yeah. box of rape right here, here's your 40 fucking pound box of rape, right? <laughs> Seed. Okay, all right. So he essentially what happened is he said there was there was a bunch of people who tweeted and you gotta leave. I was like, well, did you did you look into this? I mean, yeah. Did you did you is that's it? That's all it takes. Um, I wasn't actually really um fighting. I, like I was not in a position to to really have an argument with him. So I was probably not putting up, I, I, and I didn't, I didn't put up much of a fight. I was just like, okay. Um, and, and then he said, oh, the harassment at the panel. And I'm like, did, did you, anyway, so he said that we had to get out of there and, um, and, um, and, and then we had to be out by the time the doors opened. And so I had to figure out how to get down a installation that took three to, you know, four to five hours put up without the tools that we had put it up with. And, and the other thing is that I, I had no idea because uh, we didn't have, I didn't have, I, I didn't have a car. Um, my okay. husband had dropped us off to go park. And so I had this task and I didn't know how I was going to accomplish it. And um, what was so interesting was the, was the security guards that were hovering around really close. And, um, and, uh, and it was, it was getting really, really stressful. I remember. And people were getting a little bit testy towards each other in, in the booth. And um, so I, I remember looking up and the security guards were laughing, probably not anything. They might not have been actually laughing at us or anything related to us, but it was just really overwhelming at that moment. So I went out um, a little ways and, and I started to cry. Um, and, uh, and after that, they, they backed off a little. Um, and then, I, and then, the the customer service people finally relented and said we could take get the car in by the 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 uh the bay doors the bay doors that were right by the our booth or there was like a ramp where you could drive the car into the back of the exhibition hall which is where we were and then just go through and and then they gave us a cart um so we could do this yeah i don't know if that if i don't know if it was because they cared or they just wanted to just get the fuck out of there but um, so we, we managed, my, my husband managed to scrounge some tools from the car and we managed to get everything down and out. Um, we didn't make the, I think it was, a t it was either 10 or 11 that we were supposed to make. Um, and we didn't make it that at quite at that time, but we did get out by about half an hour after they wanted us out. And, uh, one of the first, one of the first people who stumbled by our booth and I think he was actually searching for us, right? He, mm -hmm. he was, um, he was looking for our booth because he knew we were going to be there. Um, he came across us while we were dismantling, and he was like, what the fuck is going on? And we explained the situation to him. He took a picture of all of us, and he tweeted it saying, apparently this group is not diverse enough for Calgary Expo. You know, a picture of a bunch of women and some men, one of the men being Puerto Rican, right, visible minority, yeah. right? We're not, yeah. we're not diverse enough. Um and, uh, yeah, and then he took us to, uh, a booth for, uh, you know, sort of a legal, um, uh, legal foundation that was at the Kellex. So, you know, he, he was just like, oh no, I'll take you here and maybe you can get some advice as to, you know, what you can do about this. But, um, essentially it, it was just, it was, it was just absolutely obscene, right? That they... They would wait until every until Allison was there at what ten o'clock or something like that. Was well, just a bit before, I think. Yeah, and say saying, okay, now now you have to take down this thing by eleven, right? Um, they didn't tell her or us um, that there were police waiting, um, yeah. even though there were. We found out later, right? Um, just in case, just in case, we turned out to be ISIS. Yeah, <laughs> and you know, and then. What two days later in the park? The first, the first day after, um, or was it the day of the day that we got kicked out? We arranged for a meeting in the. No, park. it was it was the day after. It was it, okay? It was the day after we arranged for a meeting in the park, and then the day after that, 
right? The Sunday. Yes. Two days. We had another meeting in the park across the street from the fairgrounds. And we were, unlike the day before, the Sunday was a really nice day. So instead of adjourning to a pub somewhere after everybody had met up, we decided to just hang around in the park and eat pepperoni and cheese trays that and veggie trays that people had brought and hang out as right? ISIS is so as ISIS is want to do maybe 30, <laughs> 30 yeah yeah as ISIS is want to do they're they're like total pepperoni themes <laughs> anyhow so we're we're sit, we're hanging out across the street from the fairgrounds because this is the best place for people who were going to attend the convention to meet us or who were attending the convention and wanted to meet us to be able to walk across the street and meet us, right? Um, so we're there, and and then we notice that there's like five or six security guards standing across the street uh, staring at us. And we're like, what the fuck is that all about? Um, uh, are, are we doing any? We're in a public park, right? Mm -hmm. And then next thing you know, there's another two fucking police vans. Right. Jeez. One of them pulls all the way up to us. The guy gets out and he talks to us. And here's the thing. Here's the thing. He talked to us. We explained what happened. He says, well, you know, it's a public park, so you're welcome to stay as long as you want. And for the record, you seem like really nice people. Yeah. Yeah. <sighs> but security yeah. had he told us that security had called him. Security for Calex had called the police because they were worried that we would commit some kind of violent atrocity on the convention. The following is a raw audio clip from the police talking to the honey badgers in the park. I try to clean it up, so bear with me. Skip ahead a minute if you can't make it out. Now you got to think how stupid these people. I, I can't you know, believe just that, gets... I can't believe they're actually that stupid. Like this must have been a premeditated uh, attempt to cause effect. What they were trying to do with that move, I have no idea. But it seems malicious. Oh well, it it's either malicious or it's like completely retarded. Like <laughs> okay, stupidity or malfeasance. Which you know, like what's worse, <laughs> right? I like. I, I'm looking at it and I'm thinking, you know, like, we had the cops called on us because we were having a fucking picnic. We were having a picnic and they were so concerned they called the cops on us. And they told the cops enough, right, about how dangerous we were that the cops sent four officers and two vans. Not a car with one officer, but yeah. four officers and two vans. Yeah. And they were probably we're just that dangerous. They were probably given a big fish story about how, how wild you guys were going to be. Yeah. Well, isn't that, isn't that SWAT is? like that? That's what swatting is in Canada because we don't have swatting in Canada. What we have is four officers and two vans who show up and like make conversation for fifteen minutes, and then they're like, "Oh, have a nice day," and they leave. Yeah, that's sure. what we have for swatting in Canada. Luckily, or someone, yeah. someone you shows know, up and knocks was, over we your coffee. <laughs> if we were in the fucking states god knows what would have happened they would have said well and we think they have guns right nobody would even say and we think they have guns in canada not even in calgary yeah calgary is a texas of canada and and we still don't have people saying oh and we think they have guns well it's like um i mean still they had a, a situation where they told armed people that we were potentially a threat that's um a little disconcerting. Yeah, no, it, yeah. it's fucked up. It's completely fucked up. And, you know, there is no record. Okay, find me. Uh, Mr. Dragonbeard. Yeah. Okay? <laughs> please, please go out of your way, do some research, and find me a single instance 
of a self-identified men's rights advocate hurting another person, you know, like opening fire on a crowd in a shopping mall, um, disrupting an event and assaulting the speaker, you know, anything like that. Find me something because the closest you'll find, the closest thing you'll find to that is Thomas Ball. Thomas Ball, a self-identified men's rights advocate who was a member of a, of a local men's rights organization. And you know what his crime was? He made some judges late for lunch by self-immolating on the steps of the courthouse, the family courthouse that separated him from his kids. So he committed suicide in an inconvenient way that embarrassed people, yes. right? That was his act of terrorism, right? Show me any case, even that stupid... Uh, Danielle Dontremont in fucking Ottawa, right? Who, oh, my teeth are broken and I have a bruise on my cheek because I freaking slipped and fell on the ice, but I'm going to blame it on men's rights activists on Twitter, right? Nobody's yeah. ever felt, we, Allison and me and the Honey Badgers, we pledged, how much did we pledge? 6000 fucking dollars? Yep. 6000 fucking dollars for information leading to the arrest and conviction of any men's rights, any person involved with the men's rights movement right who was responsible for her injuries right and nothing 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 no yeah we haven't received one word from that word none yeah and it's pretty much you know the time has expired but so it's probably not going to happen but we did put up six thousand dollars for information leading to the arrest of uh, danielle dantremont's attacker yeah and nobody ever contacted us or said anything about it but I mean, just to, the thing is with, with what happened at Calgary Expo, it took me a very long time to even sort of recover emotionally enough to just take stock of what they did, because it's not just being thrown out of the Expo. Um, the Calgary Expo and uh, the Mary Sue, particularly the Mary Sue's article where they accused me of infiltrating under our own goddamn name, <laughs> our uh, the, int- the Expo. Um, and we've recently actually gotten a response from uh, the Mary Sue to our our legal case or a legal suit against them in the expo and they are basically saying that um they are uh they are they are protected because they did due diligence to ascertain that what they reported was the truth right um but but they didn't reach out to any of us for comment no in fact in the same in the same letter that they said that they did due diligence they said, and they never contacted us. And it's like, by omission, you are saying you never even attempted to contact. Is that yeah, they, they were actually they were actually laying the onus on us to correct them. Yes, it's unbelievable. They're, and uh, the onus on me that to we correct should, them. We should reach out and to them and write to them and and make them correct their errors, right? That and that we because we didn't do that, they had done due diligence, right? Because. Uh, nobody requested that we correct our errors, so yeah. Well, no, not just that. I mean, it's it, by saying that they we should have contacted them. They are admitting by implication that they never attempted to contact us. Yeah, okay. or anyone. That, so that's due diligence. One, you don't even take. Uh, you don't even contact the people who are involved in the incident. So it's like, and the other thing is that if they had done due diligence. Um, they would have known that our name was on everything, the yeah. map, the, yeah. the, 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 our, our the program. badges, the yeah. program, the, the placard at the, at the, at the booth. I mean, they allege that we infiltrated on the expo. We were pretending to be not the Honey Badger Brigade and using the Honey Badger Brigade name. Yeah, yeah. it was, it was really bizarre. Right, that they they would take our satire and say, oh, you know, like, because honestly, I really wish that actually, Allison, I really wish you had allowed me to help write that piece of satire because I would have actually suggested that we had that Rachel was not, in fact, a uh, a normal human being, but we had gestated her in an artificial womb and then raised her in a sensory deprivation tank on a diet, steady diet of not of of goldfish crackers freaking Pokemon and and anime videos in My Little Pony, right? And her real name isn't Rachel, it's it's RKU four hundred, right? And like how because because all because this we we started this. She was genetically engineered, just stayed in an artificial womb, raised in a sensory deprivation tank just for this one fucking event. Just to prepare her for this one fucking event where she will she will be the ultimate soldier. 
She will be the ultimate mole. She will be the ultimate nerd <laughs> and be able to infiltrate the Calgary Expo 2014. It sounds like a <laughs> sounds like a background story for sorry. one of the Assassin's Creed uh, games. <laughs> yeah, like it's, it's ridiculous. Yeah, you know, and and they, they they're saying that that was doing due diligence. Like this, so that's their protection. Yeah, and, no, this is this is like the like I don't know if you're aware, Mister Dragonbeard. <laughs> I can't I can't help smiling when I call you that, but Mister Dragonbeard. <laughs> I don't know if you're aware, but one of our compatriots, Nick Redding, uh, the guy who started the Men's Rights Edmonton website, he ran for city council a year or two ago, and uh, he 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 came in he came in last, right? I, I'm almost positive my parents voted for him though, um, because my parents have a sense of humor. But the brochures, the 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 pamphlets, the the that we dropped off in mailboxes in Ward Eight, right, where he was running. Um, they said things like uh, he would in he would institute uh, a, a program of animal husbandry that would require the elongation, selective breeding for the elongation of the bodies of livestock <laughs> and pets, so that even our pets and cows and chickens, right, would emulate the phallus, <laughs> as do all of our architecture and our weaponry and our airplanes and things like that. Okay, and then he also said that uh, uh, he would bring in uh, programs because he knows that this is what our patriarchal society wants. He would bring in more programs to de-educate women, to deny women education, specifically education about the patriarchy and how it subjugates women, because this is actually counterproductive when you're trying to subjugate women. Okay, and he would also... Uh, because there are 500 and something beds in the province for battered women and two for men, uh, by the time he was done, there would be one bed for men and a dirty dog blanket for women, right? <laughs> That's what would exist for battered spousal services in the province. Oh, and his his campaign speech suggested that he cha we change the name of Alberta to Albertistan to show solidarity <laughs> with our oppressed Taliban brothers who are who are indeed oppressed just as we are under their gynocentric and gynocratic authoritarian government. Okay. So there were feminist groups in Edmonton reporting him to the police, <laughs> reporting, like literally phoning the police to let the police know Nick Redding's running for city council. <laughs> oh, because no. I guess running for city council is, is like an indictable offense or something <laughs> like that. And they're, so they're phoning to let the police know, the local police know, Nick Redding is running for city council. And then when people are calling them and, and mocking them for that online, they came back and they said, he makes it all out as if it's a joke, but he really believes this stuff. Oh, for God's sake, yes, we really want to institute a... Well, I mean, they'll, what they'll do is they'll come back and say, oh, yeah, but you really do want to um, negate the teaching of feminism in schools and shit like that. Well, we really do want to subjugate women. Come on, Allison. Yeah, that's true. We do. <laughs> I mean, you and I both, like, all we want to do is make sandwiches all day. Well, no, I just want other women to make sandwiches for me. Oh, oh yeah, no, but that's what Tim Hortons is for. <laughs> and Subway. Yeah, so it's it's like um we didn't actually put I don't know if we put it in the education thing in there. I I suggested that we make it so that um the 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 because because the the patriarchy party plan for that was like a, a like something between me and Nick and and uh, and Laszlo or Razlo, and yeah, it was a lot of fun because oh, there was one 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 thing where he we had a picture of of Nick with a toy truck and it was the caption was Nick your overlord. Uh, the Over, uh, overlord Nick has just snatched uh, a truck from truck. the hands of a, a little girl. Lay he later feasted on her tears. tears yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus Christ! And just absurd shit like that. Like no, and it was not. It was all tongue in cheek. None of this stuff was, we were advancing it was so realistically. Doctor Evil. It was so Doctor Evil. Like I'm, I'm surprised you should have put in. And he's also demanding one million dollars. <laughs> <laughs> one million dollars. <laughs> You know, because it's just like so fucking absurd. It was literally we created this super villain villain who 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 sits at a conference table on in a in an extinct volcano with sharks with freaking lasers, <laughs> right on on their foreheads, right. That that's that's what we constructed, and and feminists were like, but he really believes that stuff. 
Well, right. this, mm-hmm. this is something mm-hmm. that you'll find mm-hmm. both mm-hmm. both from people who are and, hyped. And the hilarious thing is most of his, most of his material most of his material was written by women. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Because your speech, yeah, yeah, you wrote the speech. Um, yeah, no, this I, I don't remember the, the education stuff, but it probably was in there. I think it was one of the little things with the check marks, the little bullet points with the check marks. Mm-hmm. The education, you know, deprive women of an education, particularly any education that might educate them about patriarchy. <laughs> <you> know, <laughs> <laughs> we said, yeah, it was all just ridiculous. Like all of it was just ridiculous. And we said that we would get rid of, uh, and this is probably what they found most offensive. We would get rid of rape laws because women would never say no to the holy schlong and they should just thank God <laughs> that a man gave it to them. Oh man, and then and then remember we interviewed him on the radio when he was running, right? Yeah. And, and you said, "Oh, well, we we should eliminate the word no from the female voca- from the female vernacular, from the female w- vocabulary, right?" And he said, "But then how would I ever get off?" <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> None of this we believe. He, like- he just he just like it was just like, "Damn, but then how would I get off if they weren't screaming no?" And we were just like both of us were like so I think we're so taken aback by how quick that was, how quick that response was, because some people are just so quick on the ball when it comes to stuff like that. Like the time I was reading a fortune cookie to my boss, you will achieve great wisdom. And I said to him, I would rather be stupid and rich. And he just instantly, bam, well, you're halfway there. Right. And it was just like, how how can you not laugh at that? How can you not applaud that? That was like brilliant. It was like instant. Well, you're halfway there. Right. Um. It, it just it was just such a quick response. It was just and and we we were all just kind of we were just like, oh my god, you're right. How how <laughs> how would you how would you get off if they couldn't be screaming no, right? <laughs> um, because you're you're the evil overlord. You're the grand wizard of patriarchy. Rape <laughs> is your bread and butter, <laughs> right? Yeah. It's the, but what was amazing is that they well actually one um, Nick sometimes was like what he would get interviewed. And he would he would play it straight, and then somebody would eventually be like, "This is a joke. This is a joke, right?" <laughs> <laughs> You're joking, right? He's like, "Yes, of course, I'm fucking joking." <laughs> <laughs> Jesus Christ! <laughs> Nobody, not even men's rights activists, would run on a a, Patrick, a patriarchy platform. Oh God, no! And you know, like, and Nick is Nick is spectacular. I'm just gonna draw attention, and if you can find the footage of it, I I lost track of the footage of it, but it was on YouTube somewhere. Um, of when when we had the men's rights rally in Toronto and uh, and Bash Back arrived to to uh, infiltrate our men's rights rally and 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 derail it right so they all come and they arrive and the, there's there's security officers in between us cops and stuff in between the two groups and Nick of course in his men's rights Edmonton sandwich board freshly shaven head for his Doctor Evil persona <laughs> right. Um, he just, he just walks right straight down past the cops, right? And just right into the midst of these, uh, socialist Marxist bash back, like eco-feminist trans radicalist freaking protesters, right? Yeah. Okay. So he's just standing in the middle of them and he's, he, and so somebody asked him, what, 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 who the fuck are you? And and he was like, oh, I'm Nick Redding. I'm running for city council in Edmonton. You know, Ward Eight, blah blah blah, on the Patriarchy Party ticket, blah 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 blah. Right? And they were like, oh, well, what do you think of a flat tax? And he's like, fat tax. And he looks around. He's like, oh yeah, I bet you there's a lot of fat women here we could tax. Right? <laughs> and then and then they're like, no, 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 flat tax. And he's like, and he looks around. He's like, there's a lot of flat women here too. He's <laughs> spent a lot of money on that too. Right? And it was just it was just so instant it was so automatic it's just like he just it just with oh, the, God. without even taking a breath he could come up with something like that and it's it's just such a beautiful gift i wish i had that gift but well you have the gift of filling space with your voice oh is that is that like a bad I, are, do you have a crush on me, Allison? are you are you negging me i'm going to pull your pigtails oh my god uh well you know <laughs> like Ali Fogg, then I think he was pulling my pigtails a while ago. But yeah, there you go. Okay, so is there anything else? It's getting a little late. <laughs> Allison little is, is Allison is getting tired. I'm I'm having to make popcorn right away. So okay, well, um, before uh, I lose you, then 
Let's talk just a little bit about where you guys are going online with the activities you're doing now. Um, I know you have a few different shows on your YouTube channel. Um, Rant Zerker. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That, that I, I, it's not, it's not my best work. It's just my most, um, undisciplined work. <laughs> really what it is but it is what it is it it's entertaining i hope and it, it serves a purpose it so. is uh, but one of the common things that you guys do even though you're entertaining uh in each of the formats of the show that you do is that uh, at the honey honey badgers i see a propensity towards critical reasoning let's talk about what the argument is why we disagree with it what the relevant information is that's i mean that's always helpful for people to the more they they listen to it and consider what you're talking about i'm sure it makes an impact on people's ability to actually try and apply a little critical reasoning in their own life well, well I, thanks i i i, I try well I, you know, I try to i try to think things through um think through through different points of view different perspectives and try to understand them yeah um, so, uh, agreed and and i think that i think that sometimes uh it's nice to hear people just ranting because you can actually rant because of critical thinking, right? Like you, yeah. there, it, it is okay to get mad when people are being delusional or stupid, right? Um, when, when people are, are being uh, ridiculous, it, it's, it's perfectly fine to get mad and get emotional and get frustrated and be like, what the fuck? Um, mm -hmm. and, and I think that sort of brings a new angle into it that, I mean, like I know that my shtick is usually that I'm, quite reserved and and uh, straightforward and calm and rational and all of those things, right? That doesn't always appeal to everybody. Um, the rant tends to appeal to uh, certain people a little bit more than that. So, yeah. Well, I still try to stay reasoned when we rant. Sometimes you just have to let out the anger. I mean, the thing is, it's not necessarily anger towards... particular. It's just the anger towards the behavior that I've been seeing yeah. and the attitudes of dismissal. Um, and I think so. I think that's healthy to know when people are violating someone's boundaries and are taking liberties that they don't really have a right to. Um, and in a lot of cases, uh, the liberties that we see feminists taking is that they get to put themselves as the top of a moral hierarchy in which nobody else has any any right yeah. to have a stay. So, so it's like it's like a, it is a self righteousness without representation. <laughs> so that they, they sorry, go ahead, Karen. Oh yeah, no, I agree. It's essentially their, their, and even if you look at Jonathan McIntosh's outtakes video, have yeah. you seen that? Yeah. Dr. Dragonbeard, Miss, <laughs> Miss, sorry. <laughs> I watched it. Yeah, I watched that. Uh... Well, Karen, we can't hear you. Yeah, no, if, if you look at that and, and you think, okay, so look at the difference between what he's doing in that outtakes video and what the final product is. Right. What yeah. What's the final product of those outtakes is something that's so earnest and so sincere and so morally upstanding and so serious. Right. And meanwhile, he's like, doom, 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 doom. And the word is patriarchy. <laughs> yeah. dun, dun, dun. Yeah. <laughs> Thunder. Right. You know, um, like he doesn't have any greater freaking claim to the moral high ground than anybody else he just doesn't no oh well, no i, I don't like, know if, I don't his, know if, his entire fucking stick is an act i don't know if you guys i mean even, even in the middle of it he said acting and instead actively listen and absorb what is being said before responding you know what i'm going to give any guy listening to this listening to me permission that whenever a woman talks about her own life that's fine when she extrapolates her anecdotal experience to other women, go, no, uh-uh, uh-uh. And when she extrapolates her anecdotal experience, adds a little bit of fucking paranoia and some borderline in assumptions about men's intentions and then projects that onto some statement about men's experiences, just walk away. You don't need that shit in your life. Now, of course, this does not mean you have to agree with everything every individual woman says. Oh, he gave himself an out. <laughs> I bet you don't want to agree with me. No one person's perspective can ever represent all of feminism or the experiences of all women. Okay, fair enough. Then why do you let certain women's perspectives, certain women's experiences represent all women? Huh? 
Why? And and it's always the same. It's always the same general theme. I'm a victim. Therefore, my rep- <laughs> therefore my experience of being a victim represents the experience of all women. Yeah, it's always that. It simply means that we, as men, are not in a position to define feminism for women. How many of Anita's scripts did you write? <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. Uh, I don't know if you guys know the tagline for our show is apostasy, apostasy now, get ready to root for the bad guys. And the reason that we chose that um, was because so often the people that at first are presented to the public as bad guys or, or bad, bad ideas, once you actually start thinking about them and listening to the arguments, often it's the other way around. You know, and feminism is, uh, I think, a, a, like a highlight for that, how that can happen. I would agree. Yeah, and the, the mm-hmm. incident there, just in passing, it, it, I well, was thinking about this when you were talking about it, about the about the uh, expo that you're at. Uh, people should not underestimate the impact that it can have and, and will have on most people to have your reputation smeared by people who you, you would expect better of, people with authority or power of some sort. But also, um, the idea that the police were called on you, I, I think that part of the story might seem like it might anger a lot of people, but that really is mind-blowing when you're you're in a position when the government is ready to use force on you, over, you've done nothing wrong. That is uh, that's, that's mind-blowing. Your pers- it's, a pers- it's a perspective shift. At least, you know, for me in my court case, it was when I got those letters saying, and blah, 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 oh, by the way, we'll also throw you in prison. I was like, holy shit, I haven't done anything. Yeah. 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 No, it's, it's, it was, you know, and it, it's, it's really nice that, uh, you know, we, we're in Canada. And so they sent a couple of vans and only one yeah. of them pulled up right to us. And, and yeah. only one cop came out and he talked to us and he was very, very friendly and, and all of that, because that's the way cops in Canada tend to be in my experience. Anyway, um, I think I've only, out of all of the interactions with police that I've ever had happen, I've only had one cop who was like an utter dick, right? Um, and you know, like, so essentially, you you have this situation where um, it, it's not so much that the cops were willing to do that because if somebody calls the cops and says, "I believe these people are a danger," right? I I think that the cops should actually send you know, some people to actually look into it. I I absolutely do, right? Send the cops to look into it and see if they're actually a danger or not, right? Which is what the police did. There's nothing wrong with what the police did in this instance. Absolutely not at all. I didn't mean to Um, to make it sound like I was blaming them. The police that officer involved was... No, 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 I I know. But I I just wanted to stress that that the cops themselves are not... um, They are not the, the problem here, right? Other than that there is... Of course, there is a way that people can abuse all of these systems, right? Um, You know, I could abuse Twitter's uh, flagging system to delete people's accounts. I could abuse uh, YouTube's uh, flagging system to delete people's accounts or take have their videos taken down. I could abuse all kinds of mechanisms that are set up to protect people. I could abuse those, right, in order to bully people. Right. Yeah. And this is this is one of the things that we really don't want to look at is the systems that are set in place to protect people can also be ab- used to uh, to bully other people. Right. And to abuse other people. And that's not OK. The, it, the cops are a weapon. They are. They absolutely are. They're yeah. a weapon of righteousness when they're acting when they're acting in a righteous manner. They are a weapon of righteousness. They are a weapon of societal values. They are a weapon of our moral our our moral impetus, like what we want for our society, the cops are supposed to enforce that, right? But when they are being misled, when they are being fed wrong information, they can be turned into a weapon of attack. They can be turned into a weapon of abuse. They can be turned to into a weapon of bullying. And that's really what uh, all of these systems that we've set up to protect people um, they can also be used to silence people, silence innocent people, uh, to to uh, intimidate to intimidate people, to to punish people, right? Yeah. All of these all of these things that are mechanisms of protection can also be used as weapons, right? If people are willing to do that. So. Yeah. Agreed. Yep. I I like I really like the content that you guys bring out. Um, it is. Uh, 
you have a good bunch. You guys really work well together, at least from the part that I can see is the audience. <laughs> Maybe you squabble behind the scenes, but... Um, don't we squabble in front of the scenes? Uh, yes, yeah, but it's no, amusing. I think we actually squabble. <laughs> we squabble, probably we squabble more in front of the scenes than we do behind the scenes because we know that it's entertaining to people to hear us, you know, like lob bombs at each other. And big <laughs> and stuff like that, right? No, I guarantee you we squabble more in front of people than we do behind. You know, it's like we'll we'll be bitching at each other. And if you listen to the, the, the conversation we've had before the show, it's like, yeah, I'm going to get some cupcakes for, for John's birthday. And it's like, oh, yeah, that, I like those kind of – it's like it's not anything like uh, the, the conversation we have during the show, really. Yeah, no, and, and we'll we'll have conversations. Like Allison will be like, oh, the Karen train, eh, call sensor duck, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> You know, oh, you just like you, you, your voice is good to fill empty space and blah, blah, blah. Right. And she, she does all those things. And I, I'm like, oh, you're such a fucking bitch, Allison. You're such <laughs> a bird ass. You're such, you're such a ruthless cunt. Right. And, and, <laughs> all, of, yeah, well, and all of these things. Right. Oh, fuck. Stop whipping me, Allison. Right. <laughs> Thank you, ma'am. May I have another. Right? And all of these things. And behind the scenes it's it's completely different we're just like she'll she'll be like karen i need some advice and i'll be like okay you told me what the situation i think you're good i think you're okay right and and it's just that's that's the behind the scenes thing it's Mm -hmm. it's nothing like uh nothing like what goes on while the cameras are rolling (laughs) because it's fun to it's fun to do friendly angry um, with me, it's it's very fun to do friendly angry and be like, I yeah. fucking rip that duck's head off and shit down its fucking neck hole. <laughs> <laughs> if I ever see that duck, it's dead. Right? Well, like we did we, occasionally. Like, remember when you you sent me that flower, the picture of that gigantic flower that smells like rotting meat? I think I did, but it kind of looked like a vagina too. Though. Yeah, I said, yeah, that, that's the perfect flower for you. Yeah, I was a vagina and it smells like rotting meat. I was like, here you go, Allison. I don't know why you even sent me that picture. I just, I was just like, have a flower. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, a, like a, an eight foot flower that smells like rotting meat. Okay. Actually, it looks more like a uterus than a vagina. Yeah. Well, yeah. yeah, whatever it is, it's disgusting. Yeah, no, it's pretty gross. But <laughs> I, you know, honestly, you've sent me things that made my hair stand on end too. So, <laughs> really, what? What? I don't remember. I I remember. I, I, I only remember the emotion. I don't remember the details. I'm so triggered right now. <laughs> <laughs> safe space. Let's form a safe some, space. <laughs> it was probably some of the. It was probably some of the um the feminists that I've sent you. Mm, is that her tentacle porn or something like that? Uh, maybe, oh, clop maybe. I don't know. Maybe dildos. I don't know. No, I wouldn't <laughs> Historical that. dildos. Maybe that. Yeah. But not just unsolicited dildos. Yeah, no, no. That's she, not my style. She's never sent me unsolicited dildos. No, never. <laughs> I've always asked for them. I have standards. I've, I've always been like, send them to me. And then I cringe and hide my face. <laughs> right? And then I peek between my fingers at the dildo she sent me. So. Yeah. Uh, I don't think I've ever sent you a I don't know. You know what I mean, though. I have no Every idea. once in a while, you send me something really atrocious, like some freaking stupid feminist video or something like that, and I'm just like, no, no, no. Oh, we have to do it. <laughs> we have to rant zerk this. God damn it. Because it exists. <laughs> Why do we climb it? Because it exists. It is there. Uh, <laughs> somebody thought that this needed to happen. Somebody somewhere. All right. All um, right. I have, I have a quick question um, for Karen. This one's been on my mind for a while, mm-hmm. so as I've been following you for a while. Um, has the possibility or the discussion ever come up about having you have uh, as a, a speaker or a debater at any kind of skeptic conference or anything like that? Because I know you do sp- speaking engagement. I've, I've never been invited to an atheist conference or atheist or skeptic conference. So, yeah, this is one of the so, things. So, I mean, I, like, I, I feel... I will speak anywhere. I will I will speak at an atheist conference. I will speak at a skeptic conference. I will speak at a Christian conference. I will speak at an NDP conference. I will speak anywhere. Anywhere. Yeah, and I will tailor the message to suit the group, right? Well, for specifically um, for that I'm speaking to. For specifically for skepticism, all it has to be is a debate that's supposed to be evidence as the basis, right? Or or a discussion uh in that point of view you lay out your case based on evidence that you have. 
And I remember when I started getting into the social mm-hmm. justice uh, crazies in the atheist community, there was a lot of this stuff about certain high, high kind of profile people running these conferences saying, oh, we're neutral. Yet they would line their conference with all kinds of feminist speakers. And well, where was the counterpoint? There was never yeah. a counterpoint. And so people stopped funding them. People no. stopped going there and all the you know backbiting and fighting tore these things down. Uh, the funding is still way down from what it was. Yeah. And I, I think it's, they got what they deserved yeah. as far as that goes. Anyways. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I think, my, uh, I think they've, they've declared certain topics off limits for skepticism. Oh, yeah. I think that's slowly starting to change, but, but I, I mean, this like should have changed a long time ago. Uh, it, sh- it should. No, it should not have changed at all. It should not have happened in the first place. You're right. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Okay. And, you know, like, honestly... Um, I, I, you know, I, I look at it like I, I've, I will go on freaking Breitbart. I will go on Steven Crowder. I will also go on the Young Turks and David Pakman. I will go anywhere anybody wants to actually give me a fair amount of time to say my piece. I will go. If, if there are skeptics who want me to speak at a skeptical conference or an atheist conference, um, I am an atheist. Go ahead, invite me. Right. Um, but I, I can't. I can't storm the gates. I'm, I'm not going to, yeah. and I'm not going to invite myself. I'm not gonna, like, I'm not going to reach out to them and say, Hey man, <laughs> you freaking losers. Why haven't you invited me yet? Like, no, it's not who I am. I can just now see you and Paul, you charging in <laughs> quickly to the stage. Yeah, no, like, <laughs> people are always asking me anytime I comment on a drunk peasants podcast, People are like, when are you going to go on? And I'm like, when they invite me, what am I supposed to do? Like fucking break into <laughs> TJ's house, rip the mic out of his hand and kick him in the testicles until he stops screaming for mercy and then just take over the podcast. That, that would be like, what am I supposed to do? <laughs> I don't like that. <laughs> I, you know, like I can't do that and I'm not going to invite myself on. I'm not going to like push myself forward. If they want me on, they can invite me and I'll go on. Right. But um, but yeah, I'm I'm not I'm not the kind of person who's who's going to force themselves into um, <laughs> into spaces where, you know, where I'm not yeah. wanted. So, well, I mean, you yeah. do a great job, uh, but because I'm feeling guilty that we're keeping Allison here and she's falling asleep, uh, I wanted to give you each. No, a... no, I'm OK. I'm OK. Oh, you're you're awake okay. now. She's been... <laughs> yeah, no, I'm OK. I just uh, I, I actually um, finished up my my painting and. I might clean my hands. I might might go AFK for a bit, but I'm okay. <laughs> wow. uh, for some reason, I just uh, whatever reason, I just for whatever reason, I was like like thinking back of, of what we were talking about with Sean Hinkleman, and I just couldn't follow the conversation completely. Uh, no, it's it's just actually dealing with stuff that's yeah. not pleasant. Yeah, it's just um, yeah, it's a uh, it's unfortunate. So I mean, they really did actually. <laughs> nuke nuke my career from low orbit yeah no and i mean like this is this is i mean it's not even just that like it it was just this like budding career of a nobody i mean like at the saskatoon convention um you had a you you had someone offer uh you a job teaching art yeah i mean it is a bit like it, it it's not I'm not like in a. I'm not in a like a. At least in in terms of this, I'm I'm not in a huge position in terms of my of my comic book. But yeah, I wasn't like the 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 work that I go into is design. I've also I'm sort of like I'm not a, I'm not I'm an, an emer- I would be classified as an emerging artist. Um, but I was prior to this, and it was in 2007 that I received like a Canadian Council of the Arts grant for like sixteen thousand dollars. Um, and I mean, that's, that, that whole project is completed, but, um, with, with this, um, with this community, everybody, you know, they talk to each other and it's the arts community. Yeah. Yeah. So it's like, this was, this was a community where I was, was potentially making a life, you know, a career out of, and they sort of torched that because now I, I, I mean, and you can't really qualify that because I could apply to the Canadian council of arts, um, tomorrow. And I, don't know if somebody who's heard my name and heard the expo will be on the committee. Yeah. I mean, it's hard to quantify this kind of damage. Yeah. Like it's very hard, but I do know that, you know, at the, the Sask expo that I went to on, on the virtue of the comic that I created, someone from uh, a art school out in BC offered me a job. So it's like, yeah, this is, this is, a, you, you've blacklisted me from a community that that's a big part of 
the 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 um the the career path that I was on or was trying to be on. So it's like yeah, but that's not going to happen again. And I think my second not my second comic book is superior, far superior to my first. You know, and uh, and I mean, you're you're just not going to be able to like sell it at an expo. Well, then what what I meant by that is like if I got a job at the virtue of the first comic book. Oh yeah, okay, yeah. You know, my 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 skills are improving. I mean, in that case, he was out of Vancouver, and I was like, yeah, I, I don't think that that's going to work. I don't think I'm going to be able to move out there, but yeah. it, it doesn't mean that I couldn't have gotten something closer to home or. Yeah, more feasible. No, it doesn't mean that your name on a blacklist isn't gonna fucking close doors, right? Yeah. Any, so it's just it's it's really freaking. It's anything that has to do with artistic artistic pursuits, the discipline. I, I think it's a, a lot of people are just kind of hazily unaware of all the uncertainties and difficulties that 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 particular pursuit comes with. Uh, I know I went to school for theater, which is a different type of art. But they warned us, we had a good teacher for our first year class. She warned us, first thing, first thing she said, most of you will have no chance at making a career in theater. <laughs> yeah. Oh, and yeah. she was absolutely no, right. Oh, no, it's, just, it's the exact same with, uh, with writing fiction. Um, the, the most, uh, the publishers that are the best as far as, you know, your chances of, of having your book accepted, um, they, they reject over 95 percent of the manuscripts yeah. that are submitted to them yeah. so when, every year when we see an artist when we see, so when we see an artist of any pursuit that's actually working and and focusing and sacrificing and bettering their skills their craft um i wish there was more appreciation from people that you know if this gets detonated that you can't just walk down to the corner store and pick up another you know pursuit of the same sort this is a lot of investment <laughs> You know, I, oh I, yeah, no. I writing this, a novel. I just get the sense of the, writing a novel and then sending it, sending it to a hundred publishers and not getting a single yeah bite. Yeah, that that's gotta fucking suck. Well, I know a right? couple. I've never of, had that, but it's gotta fucking suck. I know a couple of people from back in my uh, university days, the theater field. A couple of people who are still working in their field. Mostly, they don't make a living at it. But any success they have, I know a couple of them. I didn't even really like them because they were kind of dicks. But I still offer them my support because I think it's so awesome that they're focusing on something that they love. It doesn't really matter as much that they were, you know, questionable people in that sense, <laughs> you know. Yeah, well, you know, let's, uh, you know, honestly, um, if if you can, if if you just have yourself to look after, you can do that. I, I absolutely agree, and I, I'm absolutely for that. If you just have yourself to look after, if you don't have dependents that are depending on you, um, if you don't have children or whatever, um, it's it's perfectly fine to... Uh, but there's no way. There's no way that I could make a living writing fiction that would support my kids. Absolutely not. No way. And wow. so you, you, you sort of look at it, uh, you know, there's... It's, it's admirable that there are people who are willing to do that, you know, and willing to actually, you know, live in a co-op with a bunch of hippies so yeah. that they can, you know, do the theater thing, right? Um, as, as long as they don't have, a, you know, dependents depending on them who can't depend on them because they're not stable mm. you know, financially. Well, I mean, yeah, you, you take on your responsibilities and you need to make sure that you abide by them. Yeah. Um, I mean, in my case, the, the thing is that with, with art, you can actually make it as an artist. Um, you can get grants. Um, you have to, you have to be able to sell yourself. You have to be able to have, you have to have admin some, some marketing skills and writing skills. And that, this is something that artists don't seem to realize uh, a lot of people who go into the arts. If you don't have that, you're not going to be able to do it. Um, and I am actually very good at writing grants. So I've had like a, almost a hundred percent success rate with my grant writing. Nice. If I if I write a grant and I submit it, I get money almost a hundred percent of the time. So I imagine that that this is probably fucked it up. Now you're not conf <laughs> you're you're not confusing. I doubt that that's going to hold true now. You're not confusing grant letters with blackmail letters because I confusing. hear those can be really effective getting you money. I'm not suggesting blackmail <laughs> or anything. No, maybe 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 they might have had a little. <laughs> A, a final paragraph, a P.S. P.S. If you want your if you want your daughter to get out alive, no. yes, I know where you live. <laughs> I know where you live. <laughs> no, no, the, but it was like, uh, yeah, and all that's a bit of bragging. But it's like, um, so I, if 
if I want, if I were in a position to pursue that, I don't know if, I don't know how this would affect that. I'm sure it would not affect it positively yeah. because it's, it's a very, it's not just, it, you know, I might skate by with my name because, you know, we go in very, very different feet, different, we run in different circles. Like that, I don't think social justice, the, 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 the arts community is very social justice. Um, I'm, but I'm sure that they aren't necessarily aware of my connection to Honey Badger Brigade. But the fact is that this community also overlaps with the community that does the comics and all of this other inter- inter- this stuff related to the Entertainment Expo. So now that my name has been splashed over Western Canada in the news as a harasser and um, terrorist. Yeah. And misogynist. And misogynist. <laughs> it's, it's, it's much, much more likely that somebody on a committee will see my name cross their desk and say, nope, absolutely not. They're given yeah. the social cues, aren't they? Like any sort of media, even children's shows that you see will quite happily show uh, women or girls slapping boys or men and never getting any sort of response. It's basically just like, no, you can be physically abusive towards a man and he will just have to hunch his shoulders and take it and then work out somehow what's upset you and fix it. Yeah, because it's his responsibility to do that, right? Well, the woman's emotions is always a man's responsibility. Your emotional state is never your responsibility as a woman. It's it's just a wonderful thing. <clears throat> So, yeah, it's too bad. Most of our emotions, you know, if you if you tell that to a person, that you're basically saying, "Oh, well, here's your living hell." You say that you 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 aren't responsible for your emotions. You aren't you aren't the one person who has the greatest amount of ability to to deal with and sort well, out your emotions. You're you're yeah, essentially saying, and, and and all of it. Like th- this is the one thing that like all of this bullshit that feminists say about emotional intelligence and how girls and, and women have it and men don't, you know, no, 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 that's not emotional intelligence. Vomiting your emotions all over the place, no matter who's listening or whether they care to hear it, right, just blurting out the the all of your feelings, right, yeah, throwing tantrums, crying, you know, all of those things, that's not emotional intelligence, that's emotional incompetence. <laughs> Yeah, so, no, they'll give Omar Cotter a grant before they give you a grant. Uh, <laughs> well, they'll give a declared ice. Yeah. So it's, it, I mean, and the, again, it's not something that you really can quantify. All I know is that it, until I actually go for a grant and don't get it, and then I don't know if I didn't get it because of that or because so, for some reason between, you know, 2007 and now, my grant writing skills have, have, have atrophied or some shit. Yeah, but, um, or the grant commission committees have changed their policies or whatever, right? Yeah. yeah. Well, the other thing is that the artwork that I do, um, one of the things that benefits me with the grant writing is that the artwork I tend to do tends to be in fields that are a bit more male-dominated. Mm. So they see a female name and they say, oh, you're doing artwork that's a, an installation piece that involves programming. Oh, okay. Monies. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it's it's like, a, you know, it's a... Yeah. It's, it's interesting. It's interesting times, I guess. It's, like I said, it's hard to quantify. I do know that, I mean, the total amount that I spent on that exhibit, which I could have used for 10 years, you know, <laughs> like, or, or for, for many, many, many years to come, because um, I could scale it down or scale it up. It was very modular. Um, but because I now can't go to the exhi- the exhibition, of course, they gave me the option to go to the ex- to the expo in two years, but I would have to basically accept uh, guilt. Yeah, oh. public shaming. Yeah, I would have to accept that that I would have to appeal is what they said. They have to put a scarlet letter on you and you have to walk around the convention. Well, no, they said that I would have to appeal to the board to let in. I'm not yeah. going to fucking appeal to their fucking board. I'm sorry, no. Yeah. Um, Bow before it, us is the uh, the tone. Yeah, essentially, yeah. And uh and and say that that my my behavior was so objectionable. Not only did they kick me out, but they smeared my name across the fucking press right. in Western Canada. Um, and so, yeah, it's like, like I said, I don't, I, I can't quantify it, but the, the installation itself was not cheap. I did it as cheaply as I could, but it still wasn't cheap. Yeah. Well, this is what so, I mean about sacrifice, uh, sacrifice for your craft. The, the whole booth was like something like $5,000 altogether, right? From, yeah. Yeah. From the but for 10 years, I mean, 10 years, you know, yeah, you're I, looking at two conventions, that's, uh, it's like 250. I mean, uh, and then you might be increasing in sales each year. Yeah, it's, no, it's, 
it's 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 an investment right that's, yeah. that's what it is you mortgaged you, you took out a mortgage and on the understanding that you would have a house to live in mm -hmm. and, and then they were like yeah no we're gonna burn your house down but you still you know now have fun paying the mortgage yeah. yeah so i mean there's there's that that financial cost and then the then the, the un the unmeasurables which are how, how how much has this affected my chances with grant writing how much is this uh, well obviously i'm not going to be going be able to go to a convention where i got a job offer so i'm not i'm not going to be able to go to those conventions anymore even though my work is improving and and you know and and the, the, it's not even it goes above and beyond the cost of the, the 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 books that i won't be selling anymore which i was fairly successful at as well and they so it's like and i'm sure that they did this in the name of diversity Right, you know, some kind of safety issue tied in with this concept, this nebulous concept of diversity, which we're all moving towards. Which, again, you know, freedom of speech is critical towards in the sense that you don't just want people who are different shades of skin, uh, male and female. The diversity of ideas is essential. Mm -hmm. You know, they're actually doing the opposite of what they should be doing mm -hmm. if those are really their values. You know, actions speak a lot those louder than words, I don't think right? Those are their values. Yeah. I think they're just using the words to justify their own desire for power and control. Yeah, like when uh, every rock star uh, or movie star gets an award, I'd like to thank God. <laughs> it's like, do you all really want to thank him? <laughs> well, I mean, I'm not exactly an atheist, but so I'm not really gonna gonna have a problem with that. But uh, the uh, it, actually, I don't even know where that where you were going with that one. <laughs> Uh, just the idea that people often say that they're about something because it they perceive it as a popular thing to do. So I'm not saying these people don't believe in oh, God. Oh, I see, yeah. I'm just saying the reason they all say it is because it's expected that this is what they're supposed to say, and so they say it. Yeah, and in, in, in some ways it does, doesn't does really make sense. But, yeah, I, I can understand what you're saying. I, I, don't, I don't actually think they use the words in the same way that, that people say, and I would like to thank God for this. I, I think they're using them to try to develop a sense of moral self-righteousness so that they can, you know, punch you from, you know, punch down yeah. essentially from their little pulpit. Yep. <sighs> yep. Oh, I think we lost Karen. Oh. Is she... No, no, you didn't lose me. You didn't lose me. I was busy doing something noisy. And, you know, <laughs> I was worried you might be murdering your dog. dog. <laughs> uh, no, I was actually cutting some vegetables for my boyfriend because that's something I do. Mm. I was, I was. He, he he wanted some vegetables with salt and pepper, and I cut him some vegetables with salt and pepper. Tomatoes and cucumbers and bell peppers and red onions. You're making me hungry. Yeah, well, you know, it's one of the few things that he can actually eat. So, um, yeah. He eats it. <laughs> so he eats it. He's, he's just like, I, I, I want vegetables. And vegetables are probably the most flavorful thing I'm allowed to eat. So I want, I, I can, can you make me some, can you get me some vegetables? So, <laughs> yeah, that, that's, that's what I live with several times a day on, on the weekends, maybe three times a day. Can you give me some vegetables, Karen? So, well, yeah. I guess that's not, that's not uh, the most hefty request that can come from someone you love. Um, yeah, no, I mean, there's plenty of others. There's plenty of other, I wouldn't even call them requests. I'd call them demands, <laughs> edicts, um, you know, uh, declarations from on high. You will bring me vegetables, woman. And usually I'm just like, uh, fuck off. But, you know, <laughs> uh, I, I love him. So, so I get him those things and he, he likes, um, it, it's one of those weird things because in so many ways we're a completely non-traditional couple, but in certain ways we're like absolutely absurdly traditional. So when it comes to, um, who's putting food on a plate on the table, that, that would be me all the time. Um, every day is steak and a blowjob day at my house. <laughs> every single day um, maybe the steak maybe the steak is a pork cutlet or or prime rib or or you know something, something else. i'm gonna go eat something right now <laughs> uh, i'm not kidding i'm 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 i'm, I'm going it, afk to eat is it a blowjob allison <laughs> um but yeah no and, and there, there are certain things that I do for him that uh, that a lot of uh, feminists would probably would make their hair turn white and uh, make them think that I'm demeaning myself. But when it comes to the important things in the relationship um, regarding uh, 
oh, where's the money going to be spent? Um, you know, uh, what's the house going to look like? Who's who's invited over? Where are we spending the holidays? All of those things, right? Yeah. All of those things. Yeah. It's it's almost entirely me deciding all of those things, and <laughs> so yeah. I I don't I personally I just don't get that caught up anymore on what's supposedly traditional and what isn't because it's very individuated and there's the best you can get is tendencies like trends of what men and women tend to do um it's our perceptions that kind of lock all that stuff down and make it such a, a big deal um well I mean you know like uh, with with my mom um when like when she'd go with a buffet or something with my dad she would dish out a plate for him and and put it in front of him and all of her friends were like oh my god you're demeaning yourself right and she's like this is the guy who follows me around picks up my dirty socks off the living room floor puts all the caps off the shampoo onto the shampoo and the, the conditioner and the toothpaste puts the toilet paper on the roll right brings me a coffee <laughs> in the morning right and and i dish him a plate of food when we when we eat that like what what's what's the fucking problem yeah well i i, I think what, a lot of the times these yeah. these, these assumptions that like, we have are I, funny they're not they're not serious they're, they should be things in life that make us laugh or you know partners your partners for a reason like you click in your own way yeah no and i think i think essentially the reason why people might see the things that i do for my boy, boyfriend as demeaning because i do cook all the meals and i do bring him coffee um, I get up about half an hour before he does because I can't stand being around people until I've been awake for a while. So I get up about half an hour before anybody does actually in the house and wake up and I have a cup of coffee and then I bring him a cup of coffee in the bedroom and I wake him up and and uh, and all of that, right? And they would see that as me demeaning myself, that I make the coffee and I bring it to him in bed. I serve him coffee in bed. Oh my God, I'm such a doormat, <laughs> right? When in reality, I'm like, I I routinely, I'm like, oh, by the way, honey, I like totally scooped $3,000 out of your bank account, just FYI, right? Because <laughs> um, I have all the passwords to his bank accounts and his credit card accounts and everything. I could clean him out without even getting out of my pajamas. I could clean him out in that space of time between when I make the coffee and when I bring him the coffee, right? Could completely bankrupt him. Right. I have total control over the finances and none of them, none of these same people who think I'm demeaning him by demeaning myself by bringing him coffee in the morning would think that I'm demeaning him by having total control over his money. Yeah, I, I don't. This is, again, people want things black and white, very simple. They want the world very, very cartoony, simple. And this is, I think, why it's part of the motivation for them to just look at everyone and go, oh, you don't fit into that category exactly, then these are the things that don't conform, they must be bad. Yeah, no, and, and like, I, I don't want anybody on this podcast, anybody listening, to think that, like, I'm, you know, lording over the money or anything <laughs> like that. It's, it's just that I have access to all the money, it's my job to pay the bills, it's my job to make sure things are on top of, and it's my job to let him know when he says, I want to buy this thing on Steam, or I want to buy a Pebble Watch, or I want to buy this. Because he's the spender uh, <laughs> of the two of us. He's the one who go. spends money on stuff. Right? Um, it's, you know, he's, he will say, is it in the budget for me to buy this this month? Right? And, and I'll, 99% of the time I'll be like, just fucking buy it. I don't care. Just fucking, don't even, just buy it. If you want it, <laughs> buy it. Right? Um, it, it, it's, it's a hundred dollars. Who cares? Right. You know, like look at how much you make. And so, you know, like it, it's, it's essentially, I'm, I'm not, I'm, I'm, I'm not keeping him in the bounds of financial servitude is what I'm saying. Yeah. And I think again, yes. that's, that's, and I bring in, bring in about a third to a half of the money. So that, that type of arrangement where one person's better at kind of organizing it or the other one just doesn't want to, whatever, where one partner does that is I think very common. Where it becomes a problem is when it becomes what, you know, like sort of financially abusive is where yeah. you, you're not given, if you want to ask about it, you're not allowed to ask about it. Or you're told what you're going to do with, with your allowance, essentially. Yeah, that that would be a completely different situation. Oh, God. Oh, God. There's no allowance. There's no <laughs> allowance in this house. If I want to spend money, I spend it. If he wants to spend money, he spends it. If either of us are overspending, we talk about it and and we deal with it and that's that's how we work things 
um, it's, it's essentially, I would never, ever like, I would, I would essentially like when, okay, when we spent $1,600 on a treadmill, yeah, I was the one who, who looked at our finances and, and decided that, okay, yes, it's okay to spend this money that he wants to spend on this $1,600 freaking treadmill, right? We don't have a bathtub upstairs because he bought that treadmill. <laughs> Um, but I'm willing to live with that. He's the one who is lamenting not having a bathtub. Well, serves you right. You wanted the treadmill. It's buyer's regret. Go. Buyer's regret. There you go. <laughs> so instead of having nice hot baths, you, you get to walk on the fucking treadmill. There you go. <laughs> Which makes you miss the bath every time. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, and, and I don't even use the treadmill and I don't miss the bath because there's a shower downstairs and, and I'm fine with that. He's the one yeah. who likes baths, so. An example that would be very different, since I already told you a little bit about my uh, ex, um, would be that by the end, this is for a couple of years, um, I would have to, we each had our own account. I would have to, this is to avoid fighting in front of our kid. This is how the pressure, oh. yeah, this is how the pressure was always created. Because people, oh, no. people often have the reaction when I, when I just share a little bit of information of, well, why'd you let her do that? It's like, well, after you have a kid together and the kid's yeah. just becoming the pawn, it's amazing yeah. what kind of pressure can be brought to bear. Yes. So in my case, financially anyways, we each had our own account, and I would have to give her a check for the line share of the money. I was often left with so little that during one, the two weeks I would be out on the road, I would have to just pinch pennies for food and make sure I w wasn't starving like in the truck. And So, so, so she literally, you, you guys literally split your finances, but you are contributing more. Uh, well, she was at home. She stayed at home. And so the money all came from uh -huh. me. It would flow into her account and she would control it. And there was some debt that, that uh, we each had at the beginning. I ended up going bankrupt on mine because no money was going into paying mine off. Um, and Ooh. yeah, hers. She, okay. So long story short, I wasn't allowed to see, ask any questions about finances for the last couple of years or she'd go into a hissy fit, like just screaming and yelling and um, and meanwhile, to avoid any problems with her, because she kept accusing me of, of hoarding money of some kind, um, I mm -hmm. let my bank statement go directly home so she could see all my checks go in, mm -hmm. her take the money, and she still would accuse me of taking money. And I'm like, like having money somewhere. I'm like, well, look, you have the information right here. And yet I wasn't allowed to ask about, you know, the finances on her side. Well, when you... Oh, where, where she was spending the money. Right. So she claimed it was for her old student loans and for her credit card that we spend on a few things, which was, you know, that's fine. Uh, the attitude, the way she behaved still wasn't. But when you get divorced and the court wants your information, you have to give how much money you have and your assets and stuff like that. And so she had to tell, say how much she had in her bank mm -hmm. account. She had thousands of dollars, not tens of thousands, but she had thousands of dollars in there she hadn't told me about. I mean, I, I was, you know, eating hot dogs, and cold hot dogs and stuff in my truck, you know, taking peanut butter sandwiches yeah. to work. It was unbelievable. That Now, that's a, a contrast from what you're talking about. That's not a partnership. That is a dysfunction. <laughs> oh, fuck. You know, like, honestly, like, I, I knew this, there was this gay couple in uh, Port McNeil where I used to live, and they used to come in all the time and get takeout at the Chinese restaurant where I used to work, and they would always be arguing about whose turn it was to pay and blah, blah, blah. Right. And I finally I was like, you guys seriously keep your finances separate. And they're like, well, yeah, because, you know, he earns way less than I do. I earn more than he does. And and <laughs> I'm like, oh, OK, that 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 makes that that makes no difference whatsoever. OK, <laughs> you decide you decide how much per month you mutually agree to spend on, you know, rent and utilities and all of those things, plus you know, uh, getting takeout once a week and, and taking, you know, his mother out to dinner and all of these things, right? What are your mutual expenses? You find out what's the raw number for that per month. You each put in half and then you keep your sec separate bank accounts for what's left over, right? But you've each put in half and then you don't have this argument anymore about whose turn it is to pay for takeout because I paid for dinner with your mom last week, right? You know? <laughs> you will actually have a joint account of joint expenses that you both feel are important and that you both feel that you should be paying into, right? And yeah. everything will come out of that one account, right? That you put an equal amount into and then whatever's left over goes into your separate account that, that that's your separate money, right? Like 
what's the fucking problem here? And then a couple months later, they came in and they they bought um, they bought takeout and they paid and there was no argument. And I was like, what's the deal? And they're like, we have a joint bank account. Right. <laughs> I was like, oh, oh, okay. Well, there you go. That's that's great because you actually turned yourselves in, from sole proprietorships into an LLC. Yes, right. right? <laughs> that that's what you did. And so now you're partners and not sole proprietors. That that's that's excellent. That's has, that's how it should be. It has a lot to do with trust issues, you know. Um when when one partner is it needs control then it's always going to come out in some way. Now, I mean, in their case, it didn't sound like it was antagonistic, but it probably underlying why it took them so long was that they weren't quite ready to release that sense of trust to the other person to merge their finances oh. that way. That's my guess. Yeah, well, well but what, what it is, is I don't think that they ever thought that they could actually join their finances, but also keep them separate um, to, to actually say, okay, we're going we're gonna to sit down and we're going to discuss how much our monthly expenses are and um, and then we're going to say, okay, we're each going to put in half of that, and then everything else is mine or yours, not ours, mine or yours, and that that's how it that's that's essentially how it you know I I think that it would probably work out between two gay guys, right? Yeah. Um, with yeah. women and men, it's it's more likely to turn into a situation of what's mine is mine and what's yours is ours, honey. Um, that, that's essentially, uh, a lot of women seem to think that, uh, that the, the man's money goes towards the mortgage and the utilities and the bills and the kids hockey and, uh, and they're in, you know, all of the expenses and, and all of those, the necess necessities, right? Yeah. And, and yeah. her income goes towards the new bedroom suite and the the new dining room light fixture and you know the the vacation in the Dominican Republic right and that's what her income goes to is toward the luxuries um and a lot of women get really annoyed and resentful when some of their income ends up having to go toward necessities uh rather than luxuries yeah um yeah. that they 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 are like yeah i didn't sign up for this because uh I, I I didn't actually sign up to support a man, and so if any of a woman's money is going towards supporting the necessities of the household, they they get they tend to get resentful and and annoyed, which is uh, it, that this just sort of an ingrained cultural thing, and I think it might there might be a biological element to it as well, um, where if they feel like there's money going out um, regarding necessities rather than coming in. Uh, they they feel like this is this is a shit deal for me. Goodbye. So yeah. So why exactly do you want this separation? Well, Mr. Stoneberg, in a nutshell, the cat put me outside. I was banging on the door for like twenty minutes, shouting, "Wilma!" I didn't hear you. Oh, there's no way you didn't hear me. I was in the shower. Oh, she was in the shower. The elephant's you trunk was on right full on blast. I couldn't hear you. you and besides, you're always All yelling you about something. How the hell am I supposed to know and when to pay was. attention? But when I want to get my rugs off, you know where to be found. You passive aggressive. Bitch. Well, yeah. one of the interesting things about the two uh, checking uh, to the two bank accounts, though, that I thought at one point was interesting is that there's kind of this assumption when you go into spousal support talk that the partner who stayed at home is owed money from the other one. Now, I, on a practical level, I understand there being a period of adjustment for that, depending on the particulars. Yeah. But, but like going on three years yes. obviously is obscene. Um, now, but the yeah. attitude really oh, is like that 17. I. The attitude still is that I kept her at home and she gave up all of that earnings she could have had for me. Oh, yeah, no, she and she did it totally against her will. You held her down yeah. and made her stay at home. Right. She didn't want to stay at home. She didn't choose that. You forced her to do it. That's right. And therefore, you need to pay. That, that's so fucked up because if you look at every single poll they've taken of working women, right, full-time working women, 66% of them or something like that, would rather work less, not more, right? Yes. And a large majority, 40-something percent of them would like to not work at all, right? And the moment, the moment that my income from, from the online stuff I do, and I'm very, very passionate about what I do online. I'm, it, it's, it's something that I would do even if I didn't get any money out of it. 
right? Like me. Even if it didn't, <laughs> yeah. Even if it didn't earn me squat, yeah. I would still do it. I wouldn't be able to do it as much. I wouldn't be yeah. able to justify dedicating the amount of time right. that I can yep. to it if I didn't earn money from it. But right. I would yep. still do it, right? The moment that I was earning enough money to scale back my hours at work, I did that. The moment my boyfriend got a really good job, not just the shit job that he had um, prior and not the EI that he had for nine months uh, between these two jobs, but a really good job. The moment he did that and it, it looked like financially we could make it without me having to work, that was it. I was done working. I was I was just like having to actually leave the house, having to actually, you know, go and, and you know, even just making sure that the laundry is done, my work clothes are clean, you know, my apron is clean and, and having to leave the house and be gone for this amount of time and come back and, and then arranging speaking engagements or interviews or, or podcasts or whatever around these two days of work that I still work, right, every week, that I never know what days they're going to be um, until the week before, right? Having to try to arrange my life around these two fucking days a week of work that earn me X amount of dollars. Yeah, no, it's not worth it, right? Not when I can afford to not do it. Yeah. So I was yeah. just like, and, and I didn't even ask him. I just, I, well, I didn't even quit. I, I didn't even ask. I just told him, I said, my boss phoned me today and said, well, it's been over two weeks since you had a shift. And if you get a pink slip in the mail, it's not because I fired you. It's because head office really doesn't think that, you know, if head office assumes that if you haven't had a shift in two weeks, that you're, you're gone, you're terminated. Oh, yeah. You've either quit or you've been fired. Yeah, yeah. Right. So, something so if you get a pink slip in the mail, <laughs> yeah, if you get a pink slip in the mail, it's not anything that I did. Um, and just, if you do call me and we'll, you know, and we'll get you more shifts if you need them or whatever. Right. And then I, then I spoke to my boyfriend and I said, well, okay. So my boss phoned me and said that I'm essentially probably terminated. Um, cause I haven't had a shift in like three and a half weeks. Uh, is that okay with you? And he's just like, oh yeah, it's fine. Do you, can we manage? Can we manage financially? And I'm like, yeah, we, we absolutely can. And he's like, oh yeah, no, that's fine. Right. It it was just because, it, you know, it gives me more time to actually yeah. cut in vegetables and stuff. Yeah. Too, right? <laughs> so, and and he and he likes that. He like he likes he having likes the vegetables. Yeah, vegetables. It's often the little things in life. He likes vegetables. He likes vegetables cut for him and coffee brought to him and popcorn made for him and things like that. So. You know. He's he's starting to sound a little bit like Homer Simpson. He just. <laughs> <laughs> no, he, he he's he's perfectly capable of surviving out in the world on his own, but he just likes having somebody do things for him. Yeah, well, and I can understand that. I yeah. would love that too. No, that's but that's what I'm talking about. Doing something nice for your partner does not mean subservience or degradation. It's just being a you love the person. You're just doing something nice for them. I don't know why that's a hard concept. For well, and he does. He's, no, and and he does he does so many things uh, for me. He puts up with so much bullshit from me. You just have no idea. You have no <laughs> idea how much crap up with from me. And like just even just the fact that I have two adult kids. I have a twenty year old and a twenty one year old who are living in this house <laughs> with us, paying each three hundred dollars a month rent. Right, that's what they pay. Barely covers what they spend in utilities and food and and whatever that that I provide we provide for them yep. right just basically yep. covers their needs and and he's just like no no that's yeah you know they're your kids <laughs> right and then I have a 13 year old who's a giant pain in the ass and and he and my boyfriend get along swimmingly and they they give each other a hard time quite frequently and and uh every once in a while my boyfriend says that he's you know, he'll, he'll say to my 13 year old, I, I'm probably going to fart in your mouth while you're sleeping tonight. <laughs> uh, be ready for it. Be ready for it. Cause it's going to happen. Oh yeah. And, oh, yeah. uh, and, and my kid, my kid is just like, he just laughs. It's just, <laughs> you know, so, I mean, you look, you look at what, what my boyfriend brings to the table and what I'm bringing to the table. I'm bringing to the table a lot of wonderful things, but I'm also bringing three kids, you know, who are still, essentially dependent 
on me, right? And uh, and he's perfectly fine with that, and it's it's a wonderful thing, especially given that he's so much younger than me. So, well, I mean, uh, having a sense of humor about your relationship, uh, being able to roll with punches. Uh, again, this is probably something that I, I, I you know, I, I don't know what SJWs. It'd be nice to see a study, a study done on the length of their relationships, <laughs> how long they go. Because <laughs> how long can you possibly hold it together through tyranny alone? <laughs> yeah, or through guilt. Yes. <laughs> just, just guilting each other. You know, guilting each other or uh, like that sort of authoritarian, uh, yeah, you need you need to do things in a certain way or you're misogynistic or whatever, right? What are you talking about? That's That's how me and Jonathan operate. Oh, yeah. I, I'll I'll go. I'll be like he cooks I'm, for you and shit. Yeah, I know. But I'll be like I'll be like um I'm gonna take a bath uh, or no what, what what did I say last night I'm gonna I'm gonna go to bed now without you because you're playing Fallout <laughs> and, was, and it's like I'm I'm gonna be you know I, if you didn't get from my tone I'm gonna be angry that you're not coming to bed with me. <laughs> see and see this is this is the opposite of me and 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 my guy right because he he's like I, we need to go to bed we need to go to bed and and i'm like okay okay when you're ready and then he's like but we need to go to bed right like we we need to go to, and i'm like uh i'm not really ready for bed and he's like we need to go like <laughs> he, he's the one who who's like and i i'm the one who's like i'm busy doing some shit well, you know, but it's it's not just me. Like if uh, on the on the off occasion that I've I'm the one staying up, he'll pointedly sleep on the couch, <laughs> and, and I'm like, okay, let's go to bed. He's like, I'm fine on the couch. I'm like, well, I'm, I'm going to bed now. He's like, I'm not leaving now. You you ruined the you ruined the moment. <laughs> you ruined the moment. <laughs> yeah, well. How will this moment ever come so, again? Uh, you know, so it it goes both ways. It goes both ways, at least with us. Yeah, no, it does with us too. I mean, like last night I went to bed before him. He he was like, but we're watching a show. And I'm like, I'm not watching shit. I'm going to bed. <laughs> <laughs> been on a six hour fucking live stream. I'm going to bed now. <laughs> so. It, wow, it went that long, did it? God, it was like from four o'clock in the afternoon until just after 10. And I was in and out the whole time. Which which uh, one was oh, that? No, and they were like talking about how I was drunk. They were talking about how I was drunk in the chat, and I'm like, of course I'm fucking drunk. <laughs> Who wouldn't be drunk after six hours of this shit? <laughs> right? Cool. Which uh oh which um yeah, which, I, I was just, which stream was that? I, I was just, I was I was just, uh Bane Bane six 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 A U. Um he he did an end of the year six hour mega live stream and. Uh, Sargon was on, and Teal Deer, and, you know, uh, like, Spinosaurus Kin, and Mr. Mini Bagel, Senior Mini Bagel, and uh, a whole bunch of other people, and uh, including Nick Redding of Men's Rights Edmonton, who ran <laughs> for city council on the Patriarchy Party ticket, <laughs> and, you know, a whole bunch of other people were in on that stream, and, and I was just like, it was it was just exhausting. It's six hours of... Uh, Bullshit. Well, it's six hours of a conversation where there's ten people involved at all times. Are, uh, so was it even as organized as us? No, no, not even close. Not even. Do, close. do you feel grateful for my presence, Karen? I do. Yay! I got gratitude. <laughs> there you go. I, but yeah, no, I was actually almost considering suggesting in the little chat on the the hangout that people enter their names when they want to speak. But then I thought, oh, is this. <laughs> probably not going to work out. Um, mm. It's it's not going to go over well with this particular crowd because you know there, it's like ten people who are all like shouting stuff out. And, <laughs> yeah, no, it was it was, it was a, how could anybody hear anything like I that? I don't even know. Like, no, we'll it's to, it, it's its own style, I guess. We'll have to go back and listen to it and see if anything is even remotely legible or or Aud uh, audible audible or or you know and we get shit for our streams yeah yeah <laughs> so what the hell okay well i'm gonna i'm gonna take off here because right. it's uh, 10 so yeah, before I've... you before you guys go could i uh just get you to let people know where they can where you want to look want them to look for you for your work um obviously um... the the youtube channel <laughs> and i will put links yep. in the show notes but 
Just don't to anyone ask, who's... Don't ask me to sexy shill it, Allison. <laughs> uh, uh, okay. Uh, I wasn't, I wasn't even conceiving of it. Oh, okay. All right. Well, unless you want to. Like, I, I don't know if that's like some sort of reverse psychology. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe maybe it is, but no, because you, you were talking. You wanted to have some Barry Manilow first. To, to... I do. I want to have. I want to have some like music, some porn music, while I do the sexy shill. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, let me let me do the non sexy shill. Um, <laughs> just uh, uh, Honey Badger Radio on YouTube. All right. Um, you can go there and check us out. Yeah, and and, and, and also if if you want to support our work, um, you can go to. Uh, patreon.com slash honey badger radio. So. It's better when you do it sexy. Don't do it, se you know, you don't have to do it, but you know, I'm just saying that. You can all go <laughs> to honeybadgerradio.com. <laughs> well, no, there is no dot com. Oh. There's none. Okay, okay, okay. You can all go to www.patreon.com <laughs> slash honey badger radio. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Oh man, it's like you're singing. You're, uh, it's like a Jessica Rabbit singing a torch song. There you sort go. Of. Yeah, I don't. I don't know how I figured out how to do that, but yeah. Or and if you want something really, really strange and sort of bizarre, you can go to my channel. Nobody goes to that channel, but uh, it's Gender Attic on YouTube. It is. It is actually a really, really interesting channel. It's got a lot of um, very sort of interesting theoretical content, uh, sort of uh, gender analysis and theory and counter theory. Counter theory. Um, that that I think it needs more needs more views, more views. Well, I, I think it, you know it's it's something that's a little bit more dense and difficult for people to 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 uh, to get into, perhaps. Maybe I didn't find it difficult at all, but then I'm weird, so. Yeah, but we're both weird. <laughs> yeah. So. Well, the only thing I've really got on. <laughs> You can go to my channel, Girl Writes What. Oh yes, that's uh, right. YouTube uh, slash girl user slash. You can you, or if you search my real name, Karen Strawn, and and you you'll be able to find some shit that I've done. If you wanna, if you want a, a slightly less weird shade of weird, that is. <laughs> it's 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 still uh, it's still very very counter narrative, but it's uh, it's not quite as esoteric as Allison's work, so yes. it's a little more accessible. Yeah, it's it's a lot more accessible. If people let's want, let's be honest here. If people want, I'm to... not gonna say that I dumbed it down. <laughs> no, no, no. I'm saying it's a good thing. I'm, I I think that it's probably like my inability to 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 um, bring things to where people are. Yeah. No, I agree. I agree that that probably my biggest strength is that I am able to take like some really fucked up ideas and just concretize them to the point where like regular people can understand them and get them and make and I make them accessible the idea is accessible to people so yeah yeah yeah, yeah. okay um, I'm gonna Allison did you want to say anything about where people can find your art specifically do you have a, a specific place oh, for that or can uh, they zenaspora.com okay well they can see my webcomic at zenaspora.com nice um and, and, and I'm not I'm not sharing my pen name for my dirty books so <laughs> Ron, I've never prayed to you before. I have no tongue for it. No one, not even you will remember if we were good men or bad, why we fought or why we died. No, all that matters is that two stood against many. That's what's important. Bagor pleases you, Kram. So grant me one request. Grant me revenge. And if you do not listen, then the hell with you. <laughs> <laughs>